All right, I think that'll do it. I think we're live. How's it going, guys? I'm Robert from Machado Visuals, and today we have a very special stream. We got Jeremy in the house. Yo, what up? Rock, <laughs> rocking that young two-up split screen. That's cool. That's okay, cool. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So we've, we've had a lot of requests um, about this one. Um, the art of camera rigging. Camera rigging 101, how do you build a proper rig? Uh, so we're going to go through our respective rigs. I'm going to build my A7S III. And Jeremy is going to build his uh, a red, like, like nice little red package, right? Yeah, Sony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are you going to be building today? A little red Gemini package. This okay. Little, this okay. little baby this right little here. Boy, we're gonna build that up. That sounds that sounds good. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions uh, throughout the stream, feel free to leave them in the comments. Leave them in the stream. Um, but first, uh, before we get into Jeremy's build, say again. Jeremy, did you say, say something? What? No. Oh. You hearing things? <laughs> I, I am hearing things. Uh, what's up, everybody in the chat? It's good to see you. It's good to see you. We're just kind of waiting for people to to filter in, but. Um, uh, mm -hmm. To kind of start things off, I, I want to kind of go over uh, basically our five principles, if you will, of camera rigging. Um, and these go a long way, especially when you're kind of preparing for your project and just kind of keeping all these things in mind. Hey, 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 how's it going? How's it going? Um, okay, so the, the first, I'm, I'm going to call them five tenets of uh, camera rigging. So the first kind of tenet uh, would be ergonomics. So, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about ergonomics. Ergonomics, where to begin? Um, uh, whenever I build any kind of camera rig, you have to think about. Uh, sorry, there's an audio loop in here. Nope. Are you on the stream? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My bad. It's my first day, guys. It's, it's our first day. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's our first day. Um, Remember my first so day. So whenever you build a camera rig, you have to think about what kind of job you're doing it for. And every job has a different rig. So it's always uh, wise to kind of like lay out all of your tools and think about, OK, what do I really need for this job? And just kind of like squeezing it all together into a neat little package so that you're not wasting time on set, you're not missing a shot, and you can do what you need to do to the best of your ability. Um, so yeah, and today we're going to talk about a couple of different rigs with different philosophies based on what kind of uh, job you're going to be going on. Yeah, and a lot of the ergonomics come back down to uh, speed and ease of use. So mm -hmm. you want to be able to change things quickly. You want to be... Uh, you want to do it in an easy way, so like that means, you know, being of, flexible. Being flexible, using a lot of toolless solutions. Like I don't want the last thing I want to do if I'm just running a gun is want to break out my Leatherman, change out this plate or whatever. Like everything needs mm -hmm. to just have this cohesive effort. Flow. Uh, if you flow, I like it. I like it. Another yeah. Part, another part of that is comfortability. Like you, I see too so many times I'll see people shoulder rigs, and you know we've all seen it where it's on the shoulder. And then the camera is sitting out in front of them as opposed to right on the shoulder. So it's very front heavy. Yeah. So you're using all of your arm muscles to, to keep yeah. that rig up. Yeah. And everyone's bodies are different, but you need to find, you need to work with your body, not fight against it. So if you have your arms out on a shoulder rig all the way out here, then that's not going to help you because you're holding the entire weight of the camera on your arms rather than being tighter. Tuck your shoulders in. Yeah, you, you want your work. You want your rig to work for you, not against you. Uh, mm -hmm. What's up, zero eight? Uh, we got Adonis in the chat. What's up, Adonis? Oh shit! <laughs> is that a red is Adonis? Is that a red? It, I think it probably is. At this time, it actually Maybe. is. Yeah, this time it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last point on ergonomics: we want, we want everything to kind of be secure. So we don't want like cables and wires, and we don't just don't want things jingling all about. And we don't want to. If you if you're able to just shake your rig kind of vigorously. And, and you don't hear anything, chances are you have a, you have a pretty solid rig. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the second kind of tenant I would kind of classify uh, of camera rigging would be uh, balance. And this kind of this ties in a little bit with uh, ergonomics and, uh, you know, again, not, having, not fighting against your rig. So you want your rig to be well balanced. So whether that means 
that you're throwing it on the shoulder, you're not front heavy or back heavy, or even when you throw it on the tripod, it doesn't sag all the way forward or sag back. Mm -hmm. um, or even if you're, you know, and this goes many different ways. Like you could throw this on a steady cam. Obviously, it needs to be balanced. Yeah. If you throw it on an easy rig, like you don't want your, your level to be, you know, you don't want to be not level. So balance yeah. is another very, very important of uh, maintaining, a, maintaining a solid camera rig. And all of this is done in prep. So don't be doing this on set, on the job. You need to test this out before you get on the job. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's what prep days are for. So if you have, the, if you have mm -hmm. the time, which I mean, we all kind of get our gear together the night before a shoot. But you know, this is all yeah. figured out beforehand. And depending on the job that we're doing, uh, we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. Um, the third tenet I would classify is uh, modularity. So modularity is, is really key, and that's what I guess, you know, that's Red's big kind of selling point is, is it's, modu yeah. it's super modu mod modularity, you know, so. Yeah. Um, There's a limit to that, though. <laughs> yeah, we, we want a, a system, an ecosystem that's adaptable. So mm -hmm. um, you, you all might have seen my A7S rig that's, you know, got everything on it. But 99% of the time, I won't be using it like that. Um, and that's the thing, modularity is key. So that way, if I'm on a job where I don't need 90% of my accessories, I'll just throw them out and then rock the camera with whatever I need. So mm -hmm. super important to just use what you need. And it, it, it differs job to job. Um, and every job is different. So you know, this, the rigs that we're building might not be yeah. something that is applicable for you. but. Again, that's that's kind of yeah. it's all dependent on you. Um, and also with modularity, uh, another great thing about that is being able to just pack your rig up when you're done. You know, just being able to pull out one Pelican case or two. I don't. Yeah. Ideally, just one. Just one Pelican case. Um, just bringing that, like me for my FX9 packages. I have uh, one case that holds two entire packages, so everything I need can stay within that entire package. Um, yeah. And so obviously it makes it easy to travel with, it makes it easy to rent. Um, if someone's come by and pick something up, okay, here's everything in one solid package. Yeah. Easy and knowing use. like what cases to pack your stuff into, it's also job dependent and it's also practice because there like there are different philosophies on whether or not should I pack each piece of gear in its own, you know, specialized case or should I build a rig and pack it all into one case? And you know that just depends on how you work and how you rent out your gear, if you rent out your gear at all. So. Yeah, and and then we'll be diving a little bit more into that probably sometime next week. I'm gonna have another guest on. This is the first time we've actually had a guest on uh, Gear Side, so that's kind of cool. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm planning on bringing out. This is kind of more of a more so a proof of concept. So um, this way I can start bringing out more guests uh, remotely, virtually. Um, so it kind of just makes it a little bit easier to have a little bit more of an interactive. Uh, stream. Um, so I guess the fourth tenet I would, I would kind of think about camera rigging are, is uh, cleanliness. So Jeremy, why is mm -hmm. it important to have a clean rig? Man, <laughs> you don't want to be showing up on the set and you're moving around, especially if you're running gunning and something falls off or you bump into, uh, you know, something while you're operating and it breaks off a piece. It needs to be functional i see so many rigs out there that have like i don't know stuff that's just sticking out everywhere on the rig and it's it's not tidy it's at like all they'll it's just not... plug in the cables and not even worry about it just it's all yeah blah. exactly it's just like a cable vomit. and it might not seem like a big deal you know when you're putting it together but you know the more you work and the more you move around you realize that it's better safe than sorry first of all because you might snag cables or you know like uh, on my FS7, someone else was operating uh, my FS7, and the viewfinder is on an arm that doesn't articulate. And so it kind of sticks out a bit far, and um, uh, the operator was being a little careless and walking through a doorway, holding the camera by his side. Viewfinder bumps right into the door jam, and just toom, so the viewfinder just <laughs> tilts out. And it's always it's been like that ever since. That's so rough. be tidy. That's right. Be tidy. Be yep. not, not only is it is it aesthetically pleasing because you know especially when you're posting pictures <laughs> <For the gram. laughs> p posting your rigs up on the gram I know you all love to do it um, but also it's functional like being 
aesthetically pleasing is in a way functional. So that way you're not snagging upon up on, uh, all your cables and, and just making a mess of everything. Uh, we got a couple comments here, so you know, I'll pull one up, see if this works. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. Zero eight says, uh, I seem to be a wooden camera fanboy. And him too. Him, her too. I don't know. But uh, no, I like wooden camera stuff. I mean, all of this stuff is basically wooden camera stuff. Um, this is actually the first rig that I've had, which is pretty much 99% wooden camera stuff. I used to like really like Secuto stuff. I, I mean, I still do. It just I mean, ultimately depends. That's kind of what we're talking about too, is, is mm -hmm. uh, modularity. So sometimes I'll, I'll throw on a bunch of Zacuto stuff on my rig if I'm doing a lot of stuff on the shoulder. But uh, for now, I've been kind of pivoting towards uh, a lot of dovetail stuff and uh, wooden camera, all their accessories kind of do it for me. But I mean, I, I wouldn't call myself a fam fanboy, but I do like their stuff. Um, yeah, it yeah. works. Yeah, it works. It's because, and it's also interesting, the more you dive into rigging, you kind of notice each camera company's or, you know, each camera manufacturer, they kind of have their own ecosystem. So, for example, wooden camera, they like to base a lot of their stuff on the Airy standard. So, like, the Airy uh, locating pin standard, they also do Airy dovetail standards, um, and a couple of Arca Love Swiss stuff. Love them standards. Yeah. Standardization standards. is key. Yeah, and it's it also ties in with how you think about building your rig, like what parts to pick. Because, oh, this little accessory might look cool and it might do a really cool function, but then it doesn't work with anything else in your kit. So, What's you know, up, that's Tilta? Like a, that's off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tilta. That's, ba <laughs> that's basically how I feel about a lot of Tilta products. Uh, a, lot of the, proprietary. a lot of their stuff looks cool, whatever, but in terms of function, I feel like it, it just doesn't, yeah, it's very proprietary and doesn't play well with a lot of other things. Um, let's see. Let me. Let me <laughs> There's an R5 behind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Man, I should uh, I should call Canon about that one. I like it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Does> <laughs> All right, we got another question in here, comment, I guess. Uh, hey, Robert, I just bought an FS7. What lenses would I recommend uh, for primes, and what monitors do I recommend for the FS7? I was looking at the Atomos Shinobi. That was actually a similar rig that Jeremy was using for a while. You used the Shogun with your FS7, correct? Yeah, I did. Um, Shogun, just because uh, at the time I was doing a lot more uh, tripod stuff, so the seven-inch monitor helped me, um, you know, obviously with framing, but it also has all the waveforms and vector scopes that I use a lot. Which, by the way, I'm colorblind, so. Those uh, vector scopes help a lot. <laughs> Can't believe you're colorblind. I know, right? Colorblind DP, colorist, whatever. <laughs> uh, so in terms of lenses, um, it looks like you're looking at uh, primes. Uh, my go-to for a, a number of years were the Sigma primes. And they're, and now they're basically, uh, this was back, I think, before they made e-mount glass. But now they make native mm -hmm. e-mount. So I don't know how kind of... How, I don't know how deep you are in the Sony ecosystem. I'm right now. I'm pretty deep. Um, so whether that means you get Sigma glass in a uh, EF mount or Sony mount, um, but that way, if you get it in Sony mount down the line, if you get a FX9 or you know whatever what, whatever other camera, you'd be able to utilize all the great autofocus and all those benefits too. But for a while, I, I was I've been using Canon Sigma glasses in terms of primes because they they kind of meet a good. Uh, Budget to quality. Yeah, budget to quality ratio, and um, in my e my Canon EF kit, I have, mm -hmm. gosh, how many lenses do I have? I have like five, five or six maybe Sigma lenses. Honestly, I haven't I haven't used my EF glass in a while since I have like a lot of Sony lenses now. Uh, but I would look into uh, I would look into sig some Sigmas uh, in terms yeah. of specific focal lengths. Like I, you know, everybody loves a good fifty. Um, I don't know what your current kit looks like, but um, I would. I I'd would, say a 35 and a 50 is a good point to start at. Yeah, especially, I, I mean, we do a lot of interviews, so that'd be a perfect little mm -hmm. little interview kit right there. So my, uh, I have a Sigma of 24 to 105, and I love that lens. It's, uh, it's obviously like a, the more budget version of the 24 to 105s out there, but I use the 24 to 105 for almost everything, especially those shoots where, oh, I just have to go out and grab some B-roll for something? Okay. Yeah, perfect. I don't even need to swap lenses. Yeah. My having, whole kit is basically Sigma. Yeah, having a good zoom 
will we'll go a long way. I, I, I do see my, I, I personally prefer primes, even with like a lot of dock work. Um, mm -hmm. But a good set of zooms will get you a long yeah. way. Uh, what's up, Kippy? Uh, the fireplace is real. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> it's hot. It is. My back is burning up right now. <laughs> um, the 99 mat box worth it. Or is that the, which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the wooden camera one or that just, is it, I'm not familiar with what wooden, uh, with wooden cameras zip box pro, I think is like 150 or 200 or something. Mm -hmm. The zip box, but yeah. they're new, like, lightweight greens. ones. Yeah. Which is really cool. I actually, I'm a big fan of that one just because it's basically the bright tangerine the Misfit Atom, except uh, instead of a rubber bellow, or no, the rubber um, shade, it's an actual metal shade, so it's a lot, you can stick filter tags on it, you know, mm. it's durable. It also has the Airy Standard, there you go, the Airy Standard LMB uh, clamps on the back, instead of the plastic rings that the Bright Tangerine matte boxes have, which, I mean, I'm honestly not a fan of those, because you pack in your Misfit Atom, and then now you have to pack in several other rings that fall out when you try to put on the lens. It's kind of annoying. Um, versus the Airy Standard, where you change out the entire back of the uh, of the um, matte box, and it stays on there. So if you want, if all of your lenses are to an 80 mil standard outer diameter or 95, there you go with standardization. You, utilizing your kit to, you know be modular to all your accessories and so with the misfit atom i have um the misfit atom and i changed all my lenses to 80 front or 80 mil fronts so i have to carry an 80 mil adapter for the misfit atom and it always falls out like it's it's cumbersome rather than yeah. getting a zipbox pro and just having one back to it yeah do you what what uh, are you using you're using the clamp on for the misfit atom right yeah i am yeah so that's what, here, well, actually, let me show you. Yeah, because I have the Misfit Atom, too, and then I have, you know, like Jeremy was saying, I have a bunch of those rings and stuff like Boom. that. Boom. <laughs> Look at this guy over <laughs> so here. So this is the Misfit Atom. It's 114 standard, but you see how, like, the actual matte box itself is one piece, but then if you have all your lenses to a different standard, I have the 80 mil front. I also have 95, 85. Um, but right now, all my lenses are 80 mil which means I have to carry around two pieces mm -hmm. that just kind of fall apart. Um, and you can tighten, I, you can tighten it in a little bit when you're, when you're transporting it. Um, yeah, you can. It's just one more thing to lose and fall right. out. You Nothing know, to keep track of. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Uh, let's see what else we got. We got a super chat in. Wow. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We appreciate you. And also, I keep I I never know how to pronounce that that uh, that handle. Is it Al Alyosha? Al Alyosha? Alyosha. Alyosha. Alyosha or Alyosha? Let me know. Thank you for the super chat. I super appreciate it. That's awesome. Uh, we have a few more comments kind of scrolling up. That man, we're getting a lot of comments in here. Um, uh, the tilt. Oh, speaking about the the tilt of map box. Um, you know, again, I kind of going back to to tilta. I. Lately, I've seen myself kind of staying away from their products. Um, it's just, I don't know. In, ter in terms of it playing nicely with, with other products that I own and and just, I don't know. It's just, I, I just can't get behind. Um, I, I don't know. I just, there's just something I can't get behind, me personally. I know a lot of, I know Tyler, one of my good friends, He I think he has the, uh, the tilt and matte box. Um, yeah. But again, we, the the point is is that you want your your gear to be as as kind of universal as possible, and you want it to play nicely with like like a lot of people are getting the the Polar Pro matte box, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But like, and it's got a variable ND in a matte box, which which everybody wants. But you can't you it's proprietary. Like you can't use any other filters. You can't use any other. You can't mm -hmm. use drop in a four by five ND. You can't drop in whatever cosmetic filter you wanted. So it's like. Yeah, it's nice having a variable ND in a bat box, but I would like to have the choice of what I use, not, you know, yeah. just using a... Uh, there 
are attachments now, though. Um, not official ones, but 3D printed ones that, uh, you know, people in the community have made. So you yeah. can actually attach mm. uh, your own filter into the front. But, you know, there it goes again where you have to make a choice whether or not you want to go with the company, like all first party accessories, or, you know, you can mod it yourself. And that's up to you. Uh, scrolling back up, we got another question here. Um, can we recommend a rolling case for C-stands or the best way to transport them? Jeremy, how do we transport C-stands? We, well, you transport C-stands in your fucking van. <laughs> yeah, I, I just got <laughs> on, a, on a rolling stand. I got a, cheat, but, uh, I got a cheat code there. I, uh, we are big fans of Pelican cases and Tenba cases. So I personally have two different long cases. I can't pull them down to show you. They're too heavy. But the Tenba rolling grip case, the 48-inch, um, it's good for that. And that's more of like a, uh, a semi-hard case, and, and it's longer than the Pelican version. And the Pelican version is the 1750, which is a hard case, and it stacks really nicely. I like to throw all my stands in those two, and you're good to go. There's also, I think, a Think Tank. I forget, what, I forget the exact name, but there's also a Think. I actually yeah. have one. It's a think tank. It's, I don't know, but it's super long and it's I pretty much designed for grip gear. So just I would I would Google yeah. think tank grip case or whatever, and it's it's really long. Um, it's a kind of a soft hard shell kind of uh, case, um, mm -hmm. but I think you can fit if you have the detachable base. If your C stands have detachable bases, um, you can fit maybe mm, let's say three four C stands in there. Um, yeah. But yeah, at the, uh, aside from just straight up using a uh, cart, um, that's right now. That's how, that's how we've been transporting with C stands for for a while now. So yeah, uh, I've actually recently kind of switched over to these stands from Matthews, the kit stands, and they're basically sturdy like a C stand, except it folds down like a regular light stand. And it's like this a C is light stand. Yeah, exactly. It's a combo. So what I'll do is uh, get the double riser because the double riser is the only one that can fit in the Pelican 1750 and it fits perfectly, like literally the exact length. And then I'll throw in a grip arm, uh, you know, the C-stand grip arm and the head for it. And so with one case, you, I can fit probably three of these stands plus the grip arms and my uh, tripod. So just a little tip there. If you do get triple risers, you it, that will only fit in the Tenba 48-inch case. So there you go. So we got another lens question here. It keeps kind of scrolling down. Um, well, first, first, if I go here, let's see here. Sorry, got to manage all these questions. Sony uh, 3518 versus Canon EF 35F2. I've never used either of those lenses, and also I guess depends on what camera system you're using. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what camera system you plan on using? That's how I make a lot of my uh, gear buying decisions. Um, and if we scroll over to the next comment here. Go with lighter lens, Sony or Canon or Sigma, which is heaps heavier. So I mean, it gets depends. If you're doing gimbal work, like obviously maybe you go with the lighter one. If you need autofocus, the Sony is the obvious choice. Um, but it sounds like you're using Sony, so I might go with the Sony um, or the Sigma. Having a, you know, having a lens that's a full stop brighter than uh, the Canon F2, like one full stop goes a long way. So, and that just means that even when you are shooting at an F2, um, it'll be that much sharper. So, uh, let's see. It's going down. Keep going, Kibby. That's an Aperture MC right there. Yep, we do have some Aperture MCs out in play. I, I got the fire going in the background. It's, it's died a little bit. I should probably stoke it a little bit, but uh, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Man, I, it's, I need glasses or something. Uh, what Aperture are you using currently? Uh, can't notice any noise. Looks good. So in terms of lighting, um, I got a 300D right here with the grid um, to kind of mitigate spill. And I got some MCs in the back to, to help push a little bit more ambience. Uh, I, I would buy, I buy it a little bit more when the fire was kind of towards the beginning of the stream. The fire was kind of raging, so it, um, it kind of died down a little bit now. So 
Um, I might, if, if it were me, I'd probably dial down these uh, MCs uh, off to the side. They're just on the, I use Citus Link to uh, put on the uh, fire effect, so. It's cool. <laughs> uh, it's chill. It's, ch it's chill. Oh, there we go. Uh, if I am working, do I work with a variable in DLMA 7 s 3 So yes, uh, I have to, uh, because you take it outside, you need NDs. Um, I, the, I really, if, you, if you've seen my previous video, you'll know that I'm not a huge fan of variable NDs. Um, there is a new uh, variable ND by uh, Revar Cine, um, which, looks, which looks really nice. I actually might get a, uh, a copy in, a unit in probably the next few weeks so I can start using that. Um, and for that one, it's cool because, you know, with the, and that one's designed that, to drop in a matte box. Um, so you'll have a linear polarizer on the front and then your circular polarizer on the back, and then that's how you get your variable ND and adjust exposure. Um, so that one supposedly has no color shift, so I'm, I'm looking forward to tr trying that one out. Um, let's see, trying to keep up with all these comments. Do I use the Sekonix mm -hmm. 800 for setting cameras white balance? Uh, if not, what's my process for getting perfect white balance of camera? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, I'm sure you might have seen a bunch of my color meter videos. So. Um, as you all know, I'm a big fan of the C800. I use it a lot. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, if I'm, if I'm entering an environment, I'll use the, uh, isn't this stream about camera rigging? Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'll, if I'm lighting, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll measure the ambience to, to give a really quick answer uh, to move off. Of, uh, I'll set my uh, ambient color temperature. I'll dial that into the light. And then I'll adjust my color uh, temperature in camera depending on how, it's more so how it feels. Um, even though if I might, I might measure a light and it's giving me 3200 Kelvin, I won't necessarily put that in my camera um, because if I put that in my camera, it might look a little too white, you know, a little too clinical. I might kind of suck out the, the life out of, you know, skin tones. And sometimes I like pushing skin tones a little bit warmer. So if my lights and my sources are 3200 Kelvin, a lot of times I'll shoot at 3600 Kelvin, 3700 Kelvin, so that it kind of pushes a little bit of warmth, a little bit more life back into the... Uh, into the uh, frame. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if we can uh, rapid fire these so I can get back to camera rigging. <laughs> Cameron says, uh, what do I think about cine lenses and their usability for solo shooting? I'm looking at upgrading, but worried it might be more of a hassle than I need. Uh, hassle as you may need an AC and struggle handheld. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I hardly ever use uh, cine lenses uh, when I'm by myself. Uh, if I do, I'll have an easy rig so I can, um, if you have something like um, this little guy, uh, which is a, you know, just a follow focus. This is a wooden camera, we talk about wooden camera again. This is a wooden camera uh, <laughs> zip focus. Um, I really like this guy because it only uses one rod, super lightweight, really easy to take on and off, and there's no kind of play with the gear. Um, but you know, again, that's hard if you you know if you're holding the camera by the top handle, and it's I don't know. By adding cine lenses, you're inherently adding weight to your rig. Yeah. So unless you have something like an easy rig to help take that load off your for your arms, again going back to not fighting against your rig, um, like it I, it can be done. It's just maybe not ideal. So it just kind of depends on the job. Yeah. Usually with solo shooting, and if you're doing handheld. I like to go with photo lenses just because you know it's the throw isn't as long and also when you're shooting handheld, um, I like to have my hand underneath the lens so that's another point of contact. So one on top handle and then one under the lens using my fingers to pull focus and zoom. Yeah, and if I'm using a cine lens, it's it's usually for a very specific purpose. Um, most of the times when I have when I send out cine lenses, I usually have an AC. But most of the time, if it's just me, like we used them yesterday, and that's because I had Jeremy on the shoot with me, and and it was also because we didn't really need to focus. It was just kind of an interview, so it all depends. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, let's see here. Keep going. Al says we got two legends in the house. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, let's see. We just push buttons. Yeah, we just push record, guys. <laughs> Owen says right now I've rigged out a pocket cinema. Uh, a pocket and have been working with only natural light with winter coming. I think it is a good time to buy my first light. I have a 2K US budget. Thoughts? What are your thoughts, Jeremy? 
aperture on the way. I mean, it, it's it's like the it's it's such an easy answer to go to just because their lights are yeah. so good. Like with two thousand, if you're buying, if you're looking about one light, you also have to think about what you're doing. Like, what are you lighting, you know? Mm -hmm. And where are you shooting most of the time? Do you need day light balanced, or do you need bicolor? Yeah, and RGB, you know, you know they've started to uh, like. I mean, that Nova is that's under two grand, right? Yeah, that eighteen hundred no uh, case. That that Nova will probably probably looks a little enticing. Um, yeah, Just and that will go a long way. Yeah, especially in terms of kind of f future proofing your your work. Um, um, but it's got great output, great color. Um, but you know, again, it depends on what you're doing. Um, I like having the flexibility of RGB um, when I'm lighting environments because I don't know what most of the time I don't know what I'm walking into. But that being said, if I didn't have quite the budget of a for a uh, 300C. The like the 300Ds are are great. Like if you're look if you had to get and now there's a 300X, which a lot of people love the 300X. Um, I haven't used the 300X, but I also am not a huge fan of bicolors. Um, that's just me. Um, um, so most of the time, I'll for a lot of jobs, I've just brought out the 300D and it's been perfect. So with the 2K mm -hmm. budget, you can get every accessory you want. Um, and yeah, no aperture. They've been they've been killing it. Yeah, they've been killing it. I agree. Um, and it's I th also another thing too is the the great thing about the three hundred is um, it's an it's an inherently small source, so you're able to adapt it to you can make a, a large source with a with a panel. Obviously, you're limited to it being a panel, so um, it's a lot harder to make that of a smaller yeah. source. You know, I forgot how much I loved lighting with Fresnels until I got the three hundred D with the Fresnel attachment. Because, you know, we start out in film school and we just use, you know, those moles, 1Ks and 2Ks. Dude, yeah, when we, are they going to make an open-face LED? We grew <laughs> up on, uh, I mean, that's kind of what the, the stock 300D is kind of like. It's basically a with the reflector. With the reflector, it's basically like an open-face. So Yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Where's that's, that 600D? That's, I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. Uh, we got another question. What's the highest ISO I've been able to get away with on the FX9 and less than perfect lighting, uh, or have I stuck with seeing eye? I, I use um, uh, Cine I use the FX9 in custom mode every now and then. Um, I would say the highest I would go is 12.8. Um, if you watch my first or my uh, FX9 version two uh, firmware video, I kind of dabble around with some of the, the ISOs. And 12.8 was is where I kind of feel comfortable going. Anything further than that, I it gets a, it, it's a little it's a, it gets a little rough. But I would say 12.8 is my com kind of comfortable limit. Uh, please make a, a video on light meter calibration. Uh, will do. Noted. I, you kind of get a little bit of that in the uh, spot meter video, uh, but I'll, I, maybe I can uh, do a better one. Uh, let's Expand. see. A7S3 rigging video when? So that's kind of what this stream is about. Um, so Jeremy's going to build his rig. I'm going to build my rig. Uh, but I do plan on putting out an actual video probably sometime next week, on specifically on the A7S3. So a lot more A7S3 content going. Uh, man, y'all just killing it with these questions. We can't even get to the, <laughs> <laughs> the actual rigging. Oh, Jesus. Have I, Zero Eight asks, uh, have I ever attempted to put my Vista Primes on the A7S III? Yes, I have. I'll do that in this stream. Um, yep, Nova. I got some Nova. Oh, we got Orlando. What's up, Orlando? Good to see you in the stream again. Have I ever tried to make a caged rig that can be moved to the gimbal tripod to a shoulder rig? Uh, or might as well have two separate cameras. It'd be nice to uh, move quickly between making music videos. Uh, yeah, so we kind of did a little bit of that with Jeremy and uh, the death battle shoot, right? We kind of... Uh, yeah. tell, tell us a little Which, bit that... I was kind of... Yeah, tell us a little um, bit about that philosophy. With the death battle shoot that uh, we did, we had to jump around a, you know, going from sticks to shoulder rig to the Movi Pro gimbal work, and then also putting the gimbal on sticks or a dolly. So it's like figuring out um, what platform do you want your base to sit on and figure it out from there, build from there, basically. And so the philosophy behind that is that you don't need to use tools to be able to take the camera off of one support system and put it on another. So that's what quick release dovetails are for, you know, picking which standard you want to be on. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about wooden camera earlier, and that's why 
you know, again, I, I, I gravitate towards th their products because, you know, a lot, and even in their name, you talk about their cages, it's a unified cage. So, you know, just having the name unified, everything is, has a unified mm -hmm. standard. So that way you can move it on and off from specific yeah. accessories and just having the rig itself be modular. And also keep in mind that every single piece of uh, accessory on your rig doesn't need to be in the same brand. Like, for example, on my Gemini right now, I have Red's top plate, but an airy bottom plate. Yeah, you mix know? and match. So it's not like, yeah, mix and match. And they all follow a certain standard. So it's pick the standard that's right for you and for your job and build from there. Um, a couple more questions. I've got a couple of people asking for some uh, setup breakdown, so noted. <laughs> my my whole setup is a little, a little maybe uh, over engineered and convoluted, but uh, might be helpful to some people. Um, does two six do, does two three hundred Ds equal one six hundred D? I don't know if that's that simple. Either way, when I get one in, I'll be yeah. able, I'll be able to test it. Um, I yeah. don't th I don't think it I don't think it quite lines up that way. But again. Um, I have two 300Ds, so whenever I get A600D, I'll be able to actually put that one to bed. All right, we yeah. got one more question, uh, and then and then we're gonna go back to camera rigging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, I own a Metabone Speed Booster uh, EF to E mount and a 2470 Tamron G2, but um, if I put my hand on the lens and focus, there is play between the lens and the Speed Booster. Any solutions? Uh, yeah, don't use a Metabones. <laughs> um, <laughs> or so, use a base plate with the locking mechanism yeah, on the bottom. Yeah, so that's another thing, too. Um, well, it, it would be from the lens and the speed booster, so you'd still have that play because the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The EF use mount the Cine is a, version. Yeah, the, there's, yeah, there is a Cine version of the Metabones where you can... It's kind of more like a PL, and Jeremy actually has one. I think he's going to grab it. But you can literally lock in your EF uh, mount, and it's, it's super solid. <laughs> I know Jeremy really likes it. So, I, that I mean, that does mean you have to go out and buy another uh, yeah, adapter. Um, which is why, you know, think through your purchases first. But this is the Cine version of the Metabones adapter for EF lenses to Sony E-mount. And it basically works like a PL mount where this turns, this pops right off. And I kind of modified mine by taking... I don't know if you can see it, but these screws on the sh uh, the flange right here, they're just little Allen keys. So I took this off and then cut a gel to this shape and then put it on top and screwed it back in just so I can get maybe half a millimeter more uh, on the flange so that when I put the lens on, this cranks down really tight. Because before, same thing where I'll lock this PL turning mechanism. Um, but there's still a tiny bit of play. So one way around that is just to put a shim underneath your flange. Yeah, I think I think probably a more budget solution would be to use a lens support. Um, and, yeah. But it's tough oh, because not that's not, what this is for. Yeah. Well, not only on not only on the actual adapter, but also on the actual lens. But it's tough yeah. because a lot of EF lenses don't have a uh, a thread to actually lock in a uh, lens support. I have mine here somewhere. So with yeah. most lens supports, you're able to kind of thread something in into the actual lens and just like basically lock it down to rails. Um, so short of actually using a lens support and the Cine version of the Metabones, uh, that would probably be your, your best two bets. Um, all right, one more question and then we're... <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So Carlos is asking, I haven't had too much experience with uh, electric cabling on rigging. Are there any resources, resources I suggest to help understand the different voltages, cables, types, and ports? So I don't know anything about electric, basically. I just look at what the uh, accessory I'm using. Um, I, I, I don't know if you're referring to actually making your own cables. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you have any experience with this, but... Uh, yeah, get a multimeter. <laughs> there you go. Um, I've never actually made my own cables. I know a couple of my buddies do, um, and yeah, I have. I, I don't know. <laughs> Short answer there. Uh, but in terms of actually uh, seeing what's compatible with each other, um, you, every kind of accessory has its own voltage range, um, and you just want to make sure that whatever you're plugging into it can support that that range. Yeah. The one formula that I always keep in my mind when doing the math on voltages and wattage and amperage 
is uh, West Virginia. Watts equals volts times amps. And that math can go either way. That's how I remember it. West Virginia. W equals VA. All right. So as promised, let's go back to rigging. <laughs> okay. So yeah. we're talking about the, the five kind of tenets of camera rigging. Um, so we got up to three. Or we got up to four. Four was cleanliness. So having a clean rig is, is very important. goes a long way. Number five is restraint. Just because you... Just because you can doesn't mean you should. I see this all the time. Jeremy, what is, what is, what is having, why is having restraint important to camera rigging? <laughs> don't be stupid. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that, man. <laughs> it's like uh, just going super extra for no fucking reason, and you end up shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people, uh, like, you just have to make sure that the accessories you're using are actually serving a purpose, and you're not just, yeah. trying, to, you're not just trying to flex on them, you know? Um, Function over form first. And, and also, stop, please stop putting LED lights on your rig. Just please stop doing it. Um, I've seen, <laughs> I, see, I see a handful of them every now and then. Just, just, please, just please stop doing them. Um, yeah. And just because you can't bring your own lights light a situation, use the available light around you and move your subjects. Right, and understand yeah. direction. You know, you got all the different variables of light, shape, direction, quality, color. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can go on and on. But um, and also, one of my my biggest pet peeve I always see with people's camera rigs is when they have like a cheap Amazon Warlord uh, matte box that's just not <laughs> even connected to the lens, like not even using any filtration. Just people using matte boxes for the sake yeah. of using matte boxes. And no flags on it. Just no, or, it or every single flag on it. I see a bunch where it's just like all the sides. Oh and, yeah, uh, that too. Just like two sides of an extreme. Just flexing, flexing. Um, let's see here. Okay, so with that, um, it's all about finding the weak points. And depending on this, all changes depending on what camera you're using. So it's important to determine the weak points of your camera system that you're using. And then find ways to um, solve them and, and get around them. And a lot of that is done through camera rigging. So to start off, we'll have Jeremy kind of walk us through his uh, rig. And by all means, take it away. Oh, man. Also, use two screws in your camera plate. <laughs> yep. Two screws. All right. Where to begin? Um, so this is the Gemini. And red in my opinion, does really good at making things modular. Um, but then, you know, the FX9 is modular too, and it also works well. Or the Canon C300, C500 Mark II. Um, but the cool thing about this for me is when I, I do a lot of narrative stuff, personally, and there's, man, where to begin? So this production module is usually what lives on my Gemini body, just because I like the flexibility of having XLRs on the back and uh, monitoring outputs easily accessible. But this is obviously detachable, so I'm going to do that right now. And then really quick, as you're, as you're kind of going through that, we have one quick question from Kane. Yeah, you should be answering questions as I... I'm doing, you know. I'm doing, I'm going, I'm going. Uh, randomly hopped in, I have a Pocket 6K, need a B-cam for talking heads. Ideally, it would also be used for run and gun dock stuff. Uh, as I always say, the best B-cam is another A-cam. So if you can get another Pocket 6K, that would be tight. Um, ideally, let's see. I'm debating an A7S III or an X-T4 um, versus a cinema camera. Uh, well, the A7S III um, is incredible. Um, I love that camera to death. It, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's what you're looking at right here. That's 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 Jeremy's angle. Jeremy's top-down angle is an A7S III, uh, but the S-Log and 10-bit 422. I mean, again, like you're talking about A7S III, it's about $3,500. Whereas, opposed if you just got a second Pocket 6K, you'd have a perfect match. Um, so, if I'm doing multicam stuff. I would much rather prefer a matching camera rather than um, maybe something that's better. You know, I, I talked about this in the, live, uh, the last stream, too. If I, if I was a DP and I had to rent an extra camera, if I was flying somewhere, I would much rather choose another of the same camera, 
even though there might be a newer, better one available or whatever, I'd rather choose the same one so I can get a perfect match. So that's just me. So I just want to show this off real quick. <laughs> Having a good top handle is super important because, you know, you have your entire investment here hanging on by, what, two screws? You better invest in a good top handle because <laughs> you don't want that shit snapping off. Mine... Personally, is a small rig one. I I love small rig stuff. Um, depending on the category that's in, because they make some shitty stuff too. But their top handle is one of my favorite accessories, just because I like closed loop handles like this rather than just one bar coming out the top. Because um, when I walk around with a heavy rig, I like to slide my hand around and just have that like positive reinforcement that my hand is locked on the handle itself. Even if my grip slips, my fingers will catch the sides. Um, and I specifically like this one from wooden camera because, or from small rig, because it includes 15 mil top rails, so I can put my viewfinder and a monitor on top off of 15 mil rails versus a NATO rail. And I'll um, talk about that later. But this handle specifically slides on its own dovetail and i think wooden camera makes the master handle too similar to this and airy also makes one but this is great for balancing uh, a rig especially when you're using an easy rig because you know you have a clamp on top now you can balance back and forth to keep it level also when you're holding a camera rig and sometimes the camera is really front heavy because of a matte box with filters or you know you have a lot of batteries in the back so it's back heavy you can slide this so it feels nice in your hand when you hold it. Yeah, having an adjustable top handle goes a long way in, mm -hmm. in a uh, solid camera rig. Um, yeah. Kind of jumping forward, we have a, got another question here regarding the preamps on the red. Uh, uh, Mateo asks, I've heard that XLR preamps on the red uh, uh, are not the, are the red, red add-on. I'm assuming they're talking about the production module. Um, that the preamps are not the best. Is that true? Um... Have you, have you used I the XLR a lot just, or no? Yeah, I, I have. And I think it really boils down to the kind of mic you're using or uh, what, kind of, like, what kind of line you're feeding it. For the most part, I've never really had an issue with the production modules XLRs. Like, they sound really clean to me. Obviously, it's not a fucking sound devices mixer, but it gets the job done, and I like it. Gets the job. Sometimes that's, what, that's, sometimes that's all you need, something that gets the yep. job done. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, uh, um, this was the other back that I can put on the Gemini for DSMC2 bodies. Uh, this is the base expander without the V mount. Well, first of all, Rob and I all on gold mount. I fucking hate V mount batteries. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I've had so many experiences where the V mount doesn't lock on fully, and you might rest the camera down, or something bumps the back of it, and the camera or and the battery just pops right off. Uh, gold mount has like a really positive locking mechanism and I mean I wouldn't use it any other way so thinking out this rig specifically though having the base expander on and the gold mount plate on it's great for basic stuff but if you're running an MDR for example for follow focus plus a wireless transmitter there's only one PTAP output DTAP and one two pin limo and they both share 3.8 amps. I don't know if you can see that. Where's that off out of focus? There we go. They both share 3.8 amps and that's not a lot. That's if sucks. you're Yeah, <laughs> dude, we've tripped this so many times. And the the dumb thing about this is if it trips this circuit, it cuts off the power to the camera itself. So the whole camera shuts down. Um, so yeah, I don't know how many of you guys. Of the MDR. Have, yeah, I don't know how, how, you, how many of you guys have seen my uh, Teradek RT review, but this was the issue we constantly ran into, and it was mostly because we were using the production module, which has that load limit of mm -hmm. basically nothing. Um, so that's super important. If you can get another uh, uh, some sort of gold mount plate that you can that to access unregulated power from the battery, that would obviously be ideal. Yeah, um, so my workaround or my eventual solution to this, I'm probably going to get the D-Box from Wooden Camera 
that goes onto this plate, the quick back, so that once it's on, we'll get you know all your power outputs unregulated and uh, at a much higher limit. And it also passes it through the battery power to the camera body. So if you do trip the circuit for uh, the accessories, it only shuts off the accessories and not the entire camera itself. So we got a question from Mike here. Can we get Super 101? Uh, I have an A7S III and a GH5S and haven't rigged either. Is it worth it to do so? And where do you start? So uh, we might kind of go over that with uh, my whole setup here. Because um, obviously A7S. Um, honestly, I don't plan on rigging this out for 90% of shoots. Um, and again, going back to your kind of question there, like, is it worth it? I mean, it just depends on what you need. So for all of this stuff laid out on this table that we will go over, um, in applications like a commercial um, or you know something with where you're interfacing with a large crew, yes, it would be worth it to rig it out. But if you're doing a lot of you know one-man army type stuff, one-man band where it's just you and you know doing small local content for whatever, um, it may not worth it. It may not be worth it to, to rig out. So um, again, we'll kind of go a little bit more into that um, as I rig up my camera. Let's see. Right. Kane says I can get an, uh, I can get another six K, but it isn't ideal for running gun. Uh, I agree with you. I am not a fan of. Um, I love this. I love the six K, but it, you know, again, it's like I'm fighting. I'm always fighting the camera because you have to rig it up to a certain point for it to actually be usable. So, um, in that point, if if you're looking for a camera where it's just ready to go, kind of out of the box, I mean, you know, I love the A7S III, so that would be a, another great option there. All right, so Jeremy, tell me a little bit about, the, a little bit about that plate. So this is the broadcast plate from Airy. Um, and I personally just like using Airy stuff just because really high quality. And it uses, obviously, the Airy standard. They came up with the standard. Um, uh, this one specifically uh, is, I personally like my camera living on the broadcast plate just because of the uh, the VCT quick release because a lot of my stuff is on VCT and it allows me to go quickly from sticks to handheld um, to shoulder which by the way there's a distinction between shoulder rigging and handheld rigging because in this new world of digital cinema cameras um, a lot of people like to operate in front of themselves now um, I know I personally like to do that, especially with our uh, videos for our channel, Ismahawk. We do a lot of action stuff. And for me, being able to move around, uh, move the camera around and put it in spots that wasn't possible before if you know we were shooting on much larger rigs or film, for example, I can, and that's where the top handle is really important because this is super solid. I can hold it out in front of me or I can bring it up to myself, I don't know if you can see, and basically hug the camera like this with my hand underneath. And with this plate, it's just a soft padding to hold and kind of move around. So I'm operating with my body and moving my legs rather than moving my arms. And so tell me, uh, tell me, Jeremy, how does that uh, factor in? So say you're using an easy rig, how does, how does that work out? Uh, how do you mean? Um, how would that, would that uh, handheld setup that you're just referring to, would that be something that would, you would also, is that applicable to an easy rig? Oh, absolutely. Because, again, with the top handle, with a closed loop like this, it's easy to rig the, um, uh, what does the easy rig have? That little clamp with a ball Yeah, it's got attachment. a little, uh, it's like a quick release. Yeah, and so with this, you can balance forward and back, and if uh, you're on the easy rig and you need to put it, set it down. Set, oh, also, the fact that you can set it down straight like this and it set, stands solid. Great, because you know you never know when you need to set the camera down to do something. Um, but yeah, even with an easy rig, like this whole setup just works really well, like quickly. I can go on sticks with the VCT. I can go on easy rig with the top handle, and if you need to jump on a dolly, which I recommend having two fluid heads if you're gonna do that, just to quickly. So one fluid head lives on the dolly, and then one lives on sticks. You can just hop on and off really quickly. Yeah, being able to kind of traverse into different builds in a, in a quick yeah, manner. Yeah, exactly. Super important. Uh, we have a little off topic question. Jeremy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you kind of handle, uh, take over the stream for a couple minutes. I'm going to try to stoke my fire 
and uh, okay, all right, it, uh, get it back to life. Uh, but really quick, the question is: if you're using a lens, um, here let me pull it up. Um, if I use an anamorphic lens, um, is using a camera with anamorph anamorphic mode or an external monitor absolutely required, or can you kind of just wing it? So, um, if you're shooting anamorphic, uh, what does the monitoring situation look like? Mm -hmm. Do, do you think having an external monitor to de-squeeze is is, uh, is absolutely necessary? Uh, if your camera itself can't de-squeeze, then yes, it is absolutely necessary to have a monitor that can de-squeeze. Um, but digital cinema cameras, at least high-end cameras, like you know Red's lineup or Airy, um, they have internal de-squeeze, so you wouldn't necessarily need a monitor to de-squeeze it yourself. But if you're on you know, let's say on um, on the Pocket 6K, you know, that I don't think that has internal de-squeezing, so you would need a monitor to do that. And also, it depends on whether or not you need other client monitors or, you know, uh, one for Video Village and stuff like that. That means all of those monitors need de-squeeze if your cinema camera doesn't have that option inside. If you can do anything internal, I'd kind of recommend sticking with that so that everything down the line stays the same or at least you know where the source of it is so you can adjust it if need be. Um, but again, it all depends on your situation. Um, also, uh, I have two different plates, uh, base plates. So this is the broadcast plate with the VCT and the shoulder rig built into it, which is the majority of the time what the Gemini lives on. But I also have the Cine plate, which is basically the broadcast plate except without the shoulder pad at the end at the bottom and it gives you the standard you know three eighths and quarter 20 mounting holes and you can see that um if you need to interface with any other accessories you know tripod plates which is important because on our death battle this doesn't hop onto a gimbal easily obviously because it's super bulky and also the fact that let me show you the bottom of this This doesn't have any quarter 20s or 3 8s at the bottom. So I can't use just this plate by itself. It This always has to go onto the VCT quick release. But with the cine plate, I have these options. So on the death battle, what I did was switch over my standard to Arca Swiss um, because... Uh, I was researching accessories for the Movi Pro, and I know Kessler makes a quick release system that is on the Airy or the um, the Arca Swiss standard. And so I had to think and rebuild my rig from there because I knew that we had some really important shots that needed to be on the Movi, and then we needed to hop off of the Movi Pro back onto a shoulder rig or sticks quickly. And so I decided just to stick with the uh, Arca Swiss standard and um, have an Arca Swiss dovetail, the Kessler one. Here, actually, let me grab it real quick. It's easier to explain. All right, as Jeremy's kind of doing that, uh, I'm back. Kind of breathed a little bit of life in that fire. Next time I'll need to uh, get some more wood on standby. Um, we got a couple questions here. Um, Ray's asking, 11 hate view mounts, lighter to me than gold mounts when I shoot with Beta SP. Gold mount was uh, the way to go. They stay on real well. Yep, uh, just gold mounts, they're just uh, mechanically superior to V mounts. I've lost a couple of V mounts just because they haven't been solidly locked into place. Um, the locking mechanism for gold mounts is, is factually superior. So it's not, um, so that's why I like having that secure uh, lock on my uh, batteries. Yeah. So this is the Kessler quick release system, and this is the dovetail specifically uh, to be used on the Movi Pro, which you have to like change out the TSU on the Movi to fit this, but once you do, this is so much better than the stock Movi Pro plate. Um, includes rails and so I would have this plate off and then just leave this on the whole time. Now the benefit of that is that this plate can hop right onto the Movi's uh, Kessler modification, and then I'll have this plate on the Zacuto VCT Pro uh, for a shoulder rig. So 
that would live on sticks. This would sit on top of the Zakuda VCT, and then anytime I need to hop off of the Mobi onto sticks or shoulder, I can just click it on here. And then, likewise, take this off and then put it on the Mobi. I mean, I say I, but it was Rob and Tyler. <laughs> but uh, that was the... And also, the fact that this is a top-loading plate. I love, love top-loading plates. Look at that. That's nice it right and simple. There. Solid. Yeah, I, I love that plate. That's actually a plate I used a lot... Um, uh, Especially for smaller cameras, it's great. Like I'll, I, I used to u leave one of those plates on my uh, Ronin S a lot of times, and then I'll um, have an Arca Swiss plate on my my camera, my A7 camera or whatever, A7R, and then that way I'm just able to plop it right on the camera. Uh, Aaron asks, what streaming software I'm using to bring in comments? I'm using Ecamm Live. It's actually the first time, uh, the first kind of stream I'm, I'm using the, the software with. I, I, it's actually got a really neat UI. It does look like it's Mac only, um, so take that, you know, whether that's a good thing or bad thing. But um, no, it's 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 uh, got a lot of really cool tools available. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, real quick about my top plate. The reason I chose this top plate, uh, Red's tactical top plate, um, as opposed to other ones, is because they had uh, the monitor output and an airy start stop built into the top plate. And also, with this top handle from Small Rig, I always recommend at least two screws on your uh, top handle. And so, knowing that I needed front and back balance instead of side to side like a NATO rail does, like if you see on the top here, it's easy to attach a NATO rail and then slide on a wooden camera, you know, NATO handle, um, which is what you have, Rob. Um, and that works great too, but I needed front and back balance. And so finding a top plate with screws that go down directly in the middle of the camera so that I can attach this top handle, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be for red specifically, just because they have these two top fans here. And so most camera top plates for, uh, the DSM-C2 bodies have a large cutout, but luckily the Red's tactical top plate had at least two right next to each other on top, and I had to put a little uh, quarter-inch adapter into the 3 8 hole here so that I'm able to put this. So we have uh, another question regarding batteries. Um, have we considered getting a gold mount shark fin? Um, yeah, we actually do own uh, shark fins. Um, so, Jeremy, why didn't we use... In this build uh, specifically, why didn't we use a shark fin? Um, to hop on and off the Movi, obviously you don't have a lot of room in the back to fit a shark fin, which is much bigger, and it would be hard to balance. And it's just overall much heavier. Um, you know, obviously you get the runtime, so you don't have to swap as much. So it just depends on the, the gig, really, if you need the runtime or not. Yeah, um, exactly. So... If we need a shark fin, we'll use it. Um, the hot swap ability is great, um, but most of the times we're trying to, if we're not using it, it's for a specific reason, and that's usually to keep the camera smaller. Um, yeah. But we do have shark fins. Yeah, because the shark fin would be like back here. Yeah, especially when you're kind of going on and off like gimbals. This. Yeah, on, especially when you're going on and off gimbals, that's uh, not mm -hmm. ideal. Um, yeah. Does the FS7 have anamorphic D-squeeze? No, it does not. Um, we actually shot a project. It wasn't an entire project, but I was uh, I was actually doing B-roll, and this was a few years ago. And uh, some of the other cameras had anamorphic lenses, and one of the producers was like, "Hey, you know, since we have them, throw it on your camera. Maybe you maybe you can get some anamorphic." And I was like, "Dude, are you are you? Sure? <laughs> I mean, this this camera does not have a D-squeeze, so it's like you're talking about a 16 by 9 sensor." Um, and they're like, yeah, "Yeah, just throw it on." And I was like, "I was." Like, re do you really want me to do that? And she's like, yeah, it's Anamor we have it. Let's just, just throw it on. So I did it. And, you know, you're talking about a two, especially when you're using a two times anamorphic. My frame, my frame was like this thin. And it was super <laughs> wide. And they got into post. They're like, what the heck? What's wrong with this footage? I'm having so many issues with this footage. And I was like, do you know, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I, I did kind of tell you. I, I told you. <laughs> but I, I asked, and that's what you wanted. So... That's what you got. So, but it's long. Long story short, no, the FS9 does not have an anamorphic D squeeze. 
Uh, so we got another question oh. here. This is actually a really good question. Uh, what fluid heads are we using? So Jeremy, what are you using? What are you using? I have a Sockler FSB 10 T, um, not the side load plate, but the uh, Euro plate style. I personally like the Euro plate because I do my balancing either on the base plate itself or on a dovetail. So I don't need too much balancing range on the actual fluid head. Yeah, the, F the Socklers are great. Um, I use a Miller. I have the Compass 20. I got it about four years ago. Still, still kicking trot. I love Miller tripods. Um, every time I, every time I uh, go to Jeremy's tripod and I use it, and Jeremy has a great tripod. Oh yeah. But every time I go to my tripod and I max out the drag settings, I, I feel like I'm always wanting a little bit more resistance and elasticity yeah. and a little bit more tension, um, yeah. which is why I love. So, yeah. Personal uh, preference. Kind of personal preference. Uh, but I do, I, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe Miller invented the fluid head. So. I think so, yeah. I, I love Mr. as as legend tells it. <laughs> as legend has it, uh, but I do love I do like Miller. Um, I have the Compass Twenty. That yeah. line has since been replaced by the CX. So I think equivalents would be like a CX Eight, maybe CX Ten or CX Eight, probably CX Eight. But yeah. hopefully uh, soon I'm looking to upgrade. My final upgrade uh, would be to like an Aero X Five is what I'm probably looking at with a new set of Dude, sticks. Dude, Miller needs to bring over the active. Uh, type quick release that Sockler just released because yeah, that shit is awesome. That stuff is looking tight. Um, yeah. The only thing that disappoints me with that is the payload capacity. Um, I think it kind of tops out in, in mid twenties. I think for the the more expensive heads. Um, but all of those features look really great. I just I just wish yeah. they would build that into a uh, higher capacity head. I thought the active. Uh, 10 or active 100 is the same as the fsb 10 mine but just yeah, the it, addition of the it only release. it only goes up to like hot mid 20s right mid 20 pounds my fsb 10 i think max is at 40 you're it definitely your head definitely doesn't go that much in okay. terms of counterbalancing because yeah. yours is pretty similar to well, mine oh, so here's another note when you're looking this is something that not a lot of people pay attention to. When you're looking at the max payload or the payload range of a head, that's measured at a certain distance from the center of gravity of your rig to the uh, center point of where the fluid head turns. So obviously this, like the 44 pound uh, max limit on the FSB 10 or whatever the limit is, is measured, I think, uh, six inches above center of gravity. Obviously with the base plate on top, um, on the fluid head plus your quick release, this is way more than six inches. So obviously the payload limit is much lower, and which is another reason why you should keep your rig nice and tidy. Because if you have like heavy stuff on top of your rig, now your whole rig is unbalanced and really top heavy. And so if you put it onto a tripod uh, with a lower limit, you can't counterbalance it. So if you're running into an issue where you know obviously you don't have the budget to get a, a bigger fluid head but you still need to use the rig that you have, try to put all your accessories lower, lower your center of gravity. Yeah, keeping things tidy. Tidy mm -hmm. boys. All right, so this is why I chose this uh, area, the small rig top handle, is because I can put top rails on it. And I am a big fan of using 15 mil top rails because I can put a viewfinder if I need it, you know, sometimes Actually, most of the time I don't have this on here, but it's there if I need it. And I also modified uh, or added rather a little small rig 15. I don't know if you can see that. It's hard to see. Flip it around. Um, like this kind of like a 15 mil, uh, what do you call it? Like rod clamp or whatever. Yeah, rod clamp. Where, yeah, there are pass through quarter 20s that I can attach to the bottom of this LCD adapter for the red monitor. And that is so that this whole thing is toolless. So when I pack down, I can just take this off and it's ready to go into the bag. I can pop this off, loosen these rails, and this comes out at one as one piece. I like to keep it as one piece just because I don't like fitting around with like multiple rods and just like try to get them at the same length. So I keep this uh, else or the EVF attachment on here locked so that both of my rails are slide in. 
in one go. Yeah, and that, that's kind of similar to how like uh, cameras like the Alexa operate too. Um, yeah, they have that the the EVF bracket. It's mounted with uh, 15 millimeter rods. So yeah, and I'm a fan of using Aries. Um, uh, EVF mount just because it's a 19 mil rod and it has a double sided clamp so when you crank this down it really locks down because one thing that I hate fiddling around with is on a viewfinder where or an EVF where you only have one attachment and it's a right here 15 mil instead of 19 mil you don't get enough grip and you find that heavier viewfinders just kind of sag down a lot even no matter how uh, tight you crank this, which is why I just took the uh, the knob off of the small rig handle instead and opted to use Aries 19 mil standard. Wind camera also makes a similar one, which I also have. Um, just personal preference, see what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question regarding gimbals versus Glycam. Um, opinions on Glycam versus gimbals on the FS7. Um, so. We, I think I've actually flown once or twice the the uh, FS7 on the Glycam. It was not fun. I don't think that a camera of that size is meant for something <laughs> like a Glycam. Not that I can't support it, but it's just a, such a small. The post is so small that it, all of, all of the vibrations end up transferring into the camera. So mm -hmm. I, it's not something I would recommend. Um, if you're looking at gimbals, I think you'd you're probably looking at something like a Movi Pro or a Ronin 2. So um, not to say that it can't be done on a, on a glide cam. It's just not very fun. And you, yeah. I, I think Which we've done. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've definitely done it before. And I, I did a, a, a bar commercial a few years back on the FS7 using the glide cam. And it, uh, it was tough because any, any movements were all of the vibrations really kind of like you'll need to really kind of beef up. You'll probably need to move up to something like a Steadicam for, for something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Active 10, just checked to be an H, uh, 26 and a half pounds. Yeah, so, you know, that's probably something similar to my what my head does, and I've already kind of outgrown that. So I would have loved to have seen the Active heads go up in the 40s, but again, they're probably limited with technology somehow. Um, otherwise, that would have probably been my next head. All right, Jeremy, so what do you got there? That, that looks fancy. Uh, this is the cable pouch from Camera Essentials. Uh, they're a great camera company. They make camera accessories for, you know, AKS stuff, for, you know, camera assistance. And I love this because you can s organize all your cables in separate pouches, easy to see, with white backing, and it just rolls up like this and packs inside a case super nicely. And then we have another uh, question from uh, uh, Matteo uh, before, you, before that. Uh, why aluminum rods instead of carbon fibers? Uh, it's just what I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, carbon fiber would be nice. Carbon fibers are great. Um, yeah, you have the drumsticks, don't you? I do have the drumsticks. They're, they're nice. Um, it ultimately depends. If I'm, you know, if, I'm flying, if I'm flying it on a gimbal or steady cam, obviously being lighter is key, so carbon fibers would be great. But... I do really enjoy, you know, like I think the drumsticks are what titanium or whatever. Yeah. Um, or titanium ones. alloy. Um, titanium ones are great because they're they have the lightness of carbon fiber, but with the strengthness of aluminum. I, I love. I still I still like using aluminum rods just because they have that strength that I don't think you get with the uh, carbon fiber, but you know it just depends. Yeah. All right. So I'm running my cables in a very specific way. Um, figuring out the correct length of cables is key because when you're handling your rig, all the cables lie against each other and stick to the rig itself. So there's nothing like extraneous flying out, you know, getting snagged. So figuring out your cable runs where to tidy up. Um, I personally like to loop this EVF cable around this handle just because I'm not moving the monitor anywhere else. And so I don't need the length of the cable to vary like a coiled cable. So to keep mine tidy, I just loop it around the top handle like this. I don't know if you can see that. There you go. <laughs> black on black on black. There. Keep it tidy. 
So we got, uh, got another question here. Um, actually, Jeremy, I'm going to let you handle this one while I, you know, put out some fires, per se. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a pretty basic question. Are manual lenses recommended? So talk to us a little bit about manual lenses, and especially now with the advent of autofocus. Uh, manual lenses? I personally still use manual lenses. Well, one, because I don't have autofocus bodies, <laughs> or at least usable ones. But it's also about control. Um, you can have the best autofocus in the world, but if you're shooting narrative like I do, you autofocus doesn't help in that regard because you have to you're making a creative choice on where to focus and how to focus. Because to me, personally, when I'm shooting narrative, I have narr I have manual control to be able to guide the audience's eye to where they want to see. But obviously, with uh, the jobs that I go out on with Rob, we shoot a lot of interviews. Autofocus is killer for those setups because you have a subject sitting there or standing, talking to camera or talking off camera. You have two cameras set up with uh, both with autofocus. It saves your life, especially with people who aren't used to being in front of camera and they just keep leaning forward and back like that. Like imagine trying to manually keep focus, just racking back and forth. So again, it just comes down to what kind of a job you need to do and what you're using it on, you know? Uh, personally, I've always had manual lenses. In fact, I have a lot of vintage manual lenses just because they're cheap, easy to use, and they, and I understand the look of it. So I use it to my advantage depending on what job I'm doing or what story I'm trying to tell. So people who tell you like, oh, this vintage lens isn't sharp enough or it flares too much or it has too much chromatic aberration or it has too much breathing. I know a lot of people talk about uh, the Sigma 50 to 100 and complain about the amount of breathing. Well, yeah, if you're doing an interview, the breathing is distracting, but I do a lot of narrative. And depending on the project, the, you want the breathing because it gives life to the image. So again, with manual lenses, like if you're just starting out, get a set of uh, vintage primes play around with them. They're like 20 bucks a piece on eBay. Um, again, just a matter of, you know, the right job, the right story, whatever it is you're trying to do. I like it. <laughs> okay. Um, Ray finds that uh, carbon fibers uh, flex too much, um, especially when using a fizz. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. And they end up skipping when using carbon fibers. Yeah, that's why, especially if I'm using something like a Art Teradek RT with super powerful motors, um, I'll try to uh, I'll obviously use aluminum or titanium just because yeah. they don't have that flex. Also, on larger cinema zooms, you probably want to go 19 mil anyway, and 19 mil steel rails. They don't. That doesn't flex at all. Yeah, 19. <laughs> especially if you have a fucking optimal 12 by. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that will not go anywhere. Uh, so we got a question. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in getting your take. Will a DJI RS2, the new Ronin S2, work with this camera? <laughs> it depends on what you need on it. <laughs> like, yeah, you can put just the body on there, but what else do you need on the rig, you know? Because um, I've seen people put Geminis on... I don't know, the Xeon Crane 2 or whatever. And literally, it's just the body and it's mounted upside down so it can balance, um, but nothing else on there. Again, what do you need to do with it? <laughs> yeah, you probably use another, uh, you'd probably be using another gimbal if you're trying to fly a Gemini or, I mean, any kind of red, yeah. obviously. An RS, something like an RS2 would not be ideal. Um, not yeah. to say that it can't be done, it's just not ideal. Yeah. Also, this philosophy kind of goes back to like, using the right tool for the job and also you just if you bought a gemini like you spent what 35 50k on a whole package you're gonna trust your entire investment on a cheap crane or a cheap uh tripod cheap gimbal you know and hanging on by one thread at the bottom <laughs> same with like so here's another thing <laughs> i used to be a valet before you know way back in the day people would hand over their cars to complete strangers, which by the way, don't valet your car. That's coming from a former valet. Cause like you're basically handing away what your second most expensive investment to a complete stranger to do anything with it. Same concept kind of applies here where you just spent so much money on your lenses and your camera. Why cheap out on the support that it stands on, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Rental. I, I, that's, that's my, that's my, probably my biggest pet peeve is when I see people have uh 
They'll get their expensive red cameras, and they'll be all flex. All, they're all they're super excited. Be flexing on the Instagram, um, and then they show a picture of their rig sitting on a Manfrotto tripod. Breaks my heart <laughs> every time. Um, yeah. So, in terms of your build, um, how's that looking? Are you pretty much set, or like what else would you uh, need to add? Um, this is pretty much the basic setup, minus you know all the. Uh, follow focus and accessories but this is the body of it um, so another little interesting note here on the top plate I have this uh, cold shoe adapter mounted to like facing the bottom so that if I have a shotgun mic here let me grab one stand by hold for sound holding for sound so the way I have this, I just have a cheap Sony shotgun mic. Um, I have uh, this attachment from Rode. It's, I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, I have that guy too. I forget what it's called, but it's a, it's a great little guy. Yeah, it's a great little guy because look at how tidy it is. It's very, like, Yeah, most short. other most other liar mounts sit very, very uh, high from the actual cold shoe. Yeah. Yeah, from where the, the shoe is, it sticks out because there's an articulating arm. This one doesn't articulate, and I don't need it to articulate because I'm just putting it on my camera. And the reason I have it here is because it's working with you know gravity. If this isn't locked down all the way, the, it still sits in the cold shoe because I mounted it facing down. Um, but I personally like this is because it sits very tight to the camera like that. And it's exactly what I need it to do, point in front of the lens. Yeah, and, that, and that, yeah, uh, and again, that helps out having it the lower center of gravity, especially since you're side mounting it, so that way yeah. it's not sticking out too far from the uh, center. Exactly. Of gravity. What I see a lot of people do is they'll mount their mic up here, which obviously doesn't work on my rig because I have the monitor up in front. And I like having, it's just the way I operate. I like having my monitor centered where the lens is in front of me because I usually operate like this. I hug and then use my body to stabilize my handheld movement to move around. And then if I need to get low angle shots, I can just grab the top handle and go down. Um, which is why having a mic up here, it messes up the balance and it covers where your hand is gonna hold. Having it to the side and tight to the camera body like this is much more ergonomic. Yeah, and, and that's not to say you'll use that every time. So if you have, yeah. obviously if you have someone running sound, like you won't even need it. Yeah, exactly. Modularity. And, uh, well, I had another cold shoe on the back here, but I had one back here is because to hang wireless transmitters off the back. And I'm a big fan of hanging transmitters either off the back like this, or again with uh, this cold shoe, it'll mount right here, really close and tidy to the side like that or even mount it facing backwards where the antenna comes out the back so you're not you know getting in the way or anything again all very tidy and very uh, modular because all of this like all of my sound accessories go off of cold shoe mounts um all of my monitor stuff and evf stuff goes off of 15 mil rails so it's just like thinking about how do I make all of this tool list? Because you don't want to be messing around with Allen keys and stuff on set to change out parts. These are useful for when you put the base of your rig together and then all your accessories should be quick release if possible. So we have a, another question kind of following up on that. Um, what about the sounds of your hands tapping the mic when you hold it uh, on your shoulder? Do you, are we picking up those sounds or do you ever tap the mic or inadvertently uh, touch the mic? No, not at all. Um, that's one of my favorite things about the liar mount specifically is because it's very good with noise isolation, sound isolation. So even though it's really small and tight to the body, I've never had an issue bumping the mic and picking up that sound at all. Yeah, that liar so, is, yeah. a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty solid one. Yeah, it's a godsend. So there you go. That's my rig. That's a, that's a that's tidy, that's philosophy. A that's a neat, tidy little boy. Uh, we got a question uh, regarding Manfrotto. So Mike's asking, uh, I've mentioned it before, what do I have against Manfrotto? Manfrotto, Manfrotto, Manfrotto. I think it's Manfrotto. Manfrotto. Manfrotto, yeah, like that sounds Italian. I don't think they say, Man I don't know. Who knows? Anyways. Manfrotto. 
Um, I just don't like Manfrotto because they're, uh, they're, I don't know, their heads are just not very strong. They're not very reliable. They kind of, they're great, uh, let me, don't get me wrong, they're great for when you're starting out. Um, I mm -hmm. have had plenty of Manfrotto uh, tripods and And I'm a fan and of their innovation. Yeah. Like uh, they, they kind of forward think, so that's good. Um, but in terms of actual, like, when I compare my Miller head to my uh, another Manfrotto, whenever I have to even use a Manfrotto, I uh, it's just like pulling teeth because I'm always fighting. And again, it's going back to fighting against gear. I'm always fighting against the head. So whether that means if I just want a smooth pan, I feel like I can never do it um, with consistent results. And that's another thing, too, to mention is repeatability. So with my Miller head or any other head, Basically, I can get really smooth and repeatable results, um, and I can I know what to expect from that drag as I am camera operating. So, whereas opposed to the uh, man, like you know, one of the most popular heads is the 502. Um, if you're max drag, max whatever, it just feels sticky. That's the best way I can describe it. It just feels sticky. Another thing I always say is that um, I think the the max level drag of my tripod, the level five drag, feels like a Manfrotto 502 in its locked position. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I... You lock down a Manfrotto, it still moves. It'll, it'll still... it'll still. And go. you could argue that my Sockler is just the Lexus version of Manfrotto because, you know, it's owned by Vitek now and it has a lot of similar similarities, but it, Sockler just makes the higher end versions of it and just that little difference makes a big difference little goes a long way mm -hmm. um so in terms of modulator so how how did we uh tell us a little bit about on that death battle shoot how did mm -hmm. we go back and forth in between the gimbal like what 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 were some of the changes that we needed to make for your rig whether that whether you were on the shoulder or tripod dana dolly to versus gimbal yeah so that's where the Sorry, tapping the mic. <laughs> um, the Kessler quick release system comes in. So this bottom plate itself uh, will sit at, on a Zacuto VCT. So that'll give me the shoulder option. And then this stays on the camera. Uh, and since it has the rods built in, I can keep all of the fizz accessories on the camera itself. So that's another thing too, where if you know that your rig needs to have all of your units, like all of your accessories on the body itself, no matter what rig you're going on, uh, for example, like the, the Fizz unit, that needs to be on the camera itself, regardless of what rig it is on, whether it's on the Movi, whether it's on sticks or, um, or a shoulder rig. So I need to find a plate that holds that unit with the body which is what this solution is for. So that way, whenever you pop the camera body off, all of the accessories go with it, no matter if it was on the movie or not, you know? Um, yeah, we had to like swap back and forth several times, which is also why we opted to shoot with zoom lenses. So we didn't need to rebalance the camera every time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> calculated. Love it. Um, yeah, zoom lenses helped a lot, especially for that shoot because we we're it was it was nice. I mean, in the Teradek RT video, I was just able to control everything from my the hand unit, so um, mm -hmm. that was super we nice had, to have. We had to run fast, so I needed to figure all of this out obviously on prep day, um, and test out your build too. We tested out the build, hopping on back and forth from the Moby to the Dolly to sticks, and so on. But yeah, so, that's yeah. A, uh, tell me a little bit uh, more about that uh, Teradek. Uh, the ACI. The ACI. Uh, let's see. This this can get a little heavy, <laughs> but you know what? I actually that's another thing about heavier rigs. I like my rigs having a little heft to it, just because it's more stable and I can I feel I can control it a little bit better. Uh, so yeah, this having, ACI. Yeah, having weight definitely helps. So just even when you're talking about handheld or just general stability, that go. Mm -hmm. Adding weight is, you know, everyone's trying to shave pounds, but um, having more weight is definitely helpful. Yeah. And set your camera down, man. Like, don't hold your camera all day. Set it down when you can. Save your back. Save you your know. body. <laughs> save your body, save your back. They're not paying you enough. <laughs> um, 
the Teradac ACI, great little unit, especially for DSMC2 bodies. It, you basically have all of your camera control through an airy style layout where on the Alexa, you know, you have all your different options here. Um, this just lives on the camera and the cable hey, wanna, just lives on there. Just on the camera just so we can see what, uh, what the actual looks like? No. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. All right, 10 minutes to boot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start the timer. But yeah, basically puts everything in a uh, easy to kind of access layout so that the AC can kind of jump in. And this was really important for me, especially when, when we were shooting. Um, whenever I needed to eject a card or kind of change a setting, I was able to just stand next to Jeremy, dial everything in. So um, super handy tool. Um, but in terms of reliability, we did have an issue or two. Um, yeah. So, um, you know. Yeah, let me see in here. Yeah, you kind of went over this in your Teradac RT video, right? Yeah, exactly. Or did you? Yeah, you have, yeah, we have some pretty uh, good camera control just from the ACI. Um, yeah. But, and I, I went over some of the shortcomings too also in that video. Um, but. Yeah. Bas yeah, basically all your settings in the red menu system is available on here. Um, just, it's just a much better layout than, uh, this guy, which is the, what is it? The sidekick? Yeah. The sidekick for DSMC two bodies. And you know, when you're renting your gear out, like when I have this out on jobs, obviously I probably want this on instead of the ACI because, um, a lot more people are familiar with this, but I don't know. It's just not very usable and the buttons are so small. I can't. It's hard to do it by feel. This one, everything is laid out and the buttons are nice and big so I can work by feel because the thing about digital cinema cameras specifically is that all your operator stuff or all your main menu control and your you know your record button is on the uh, assistant camera side, not the operator side, which is on the left where you know if you're right-handed, you operate on this side. Um, but the benefit of having this on the camera, on a digital camera, digital cinema camera specifically, is that I can work by feel. So I'm used to the layout enough to just jog through by feel, by memory. Yeah, tactile, yeah. kind of having that tactile muscle memory is also goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, this ACI also has all the ports and power built in for the fizz well i mean that's so. that's that's kind of the, the the whole purpose of the aci it's kind of the motor driver yep. for the teradec rt system um mm -hmm. the whole side menu button layout is just kind of the uh the icing on the cake i guess but basically yeah. th those motor ports are for the follow focus are basically the entire that's the, the entire purpose of the aci so that way yeah. you don't need to attach an external motor driver and you can just plug in right in there and it's kind of a neat tidy solution so this was great because we didn't need to fly an external uh, mdr um when hopping on and off the gimbal mm -hmm. they teradec also makes a just an aci version so if you don't need all the stuff for the motors then you know you can get for like half the cost and just have the menu system so regarding your we got a question from ken um no side yeah. handle or moose bars so uh I'll i do actually. when uh in what situations would you use those um, if I know I'm going to be living on my shoulder for walk and talks, for example, uh, but most of the time when I'm operating handheld just to grab B-roll or for, uh, for narrative stuff, like specifically our narrative stuff where we do action, where I need to move around lower than shoulder height. But if I'm doing, um, for example, I don't know, reality style stuff where I'm living on my shoulder most of the time and it's long takes, then yeah, I would put rails off the front here and then put on uh, this thing. And this is, this is all like airy gear. Um, it's not red specific. It's just, you know, the moose bars, you know, you put the, uh, these on, what am I doing? Man, it's my first day guys. Uh, just attach them on, two handles on each side. Um, the reason why I like using this specifically is because the handles, the, the handlebars stay on here, and then I can just slide this onto rails. If I don't need them anymore, I can just quickly pop them off. I know some people like to put their 
moose bars and handles on the base plate themselves. But like, I'm always going to be like, the, I'm using the base plate. If I don't need the handles, now I have to unscrew them each separately, one at a time. And unscrewing takes a lot of time. You double it for each handle. So having it on a quick release 15 mil or 19 mil rod, you can just slide it off when you don't need it. What about the actual side handle um, that you see a lot on red cameras? Do you ever use that, or do you do you have one? Uh, yeah, I actually do have one, and it's only for the rental kit. <laughs> I okay. have, like, I do not like using this at all, um, personally, just because it lives right here on the side of the body. I like having my side handle on this bottom point here because when, if you think about it, if I'm and this is based on the way that I operate. But if I'm hugging my camera like this, my hand naturally sits here. I cradle it down here. So if the side handle is down here, it's a lot more balanced so I can move around. But if the side handle is up here, now it's too top heavy and the camera tends to fall out this way. I don't know if you can see it. But if here, if I'm here, the camera tends to slip out from the bottom rather than being down here where I can basically rest the... Um, I can rest the shoulder pad on my hips. And for, you know, those of you who deal with a lot of kids or hold a lot of babies, are you they just sit on, on your hips babies, like that. Jeremy? I mean, I grew up with a lot of siblings and cousins. So, <laughs> his camera is his baby actually, I literally literally rest the shoulder plate or the shoulder pad on my hips like a baby. And if the side handle is here down on the bottom, I can just move around like this. So, yeah. It's a neat little boy. I like it. So um, most times when you send out your red or you're shooting out with your red, is is this the configuration that you'd be using? Uh, yeah, basically. Either the base expander or the production module if I need to run sound. Um, I personally like having the production module on here just so I can use my shotgun mic because this outputs 48-volt phantom power. Um, the base expander doesn't. It's just a like the mini jack, you know, the standard microphone port or whatever. So... In my case, personally, I always have the production module on. Um, and if I need to, I'll switch it out for the base expander if I need to, you know, lighten the load a bit. Lighten the load. Uh, we got a question regarding the uh, pocket. Yeah. Um, so any advice for tackling the Blackmagic pocket cameras IR pollution? Um, even though, even without NDs, it's noticeable in darker rooms. Uh, wanting to leave circular filters, so also looking for a good matte box system to grow into. So, Jeremy, what you said you own the Misfit Atom, right? Do you have any other man boxes or no? Uh, I had, like, this old uh, tilt to one back in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even think it's mine. <laughs> it's just someone left it in my case. But, yeah, the Misfit Atom is the only one I use right now. So a good, um, to, kind of to answer your question, I, a good IR uh, ND or F, full spectrum ND with do you do you really well i did a video i don't know if you've seen that video from a few months back but i did a video comparing a few different irnds um and in terms of actual map boxes um say anyway stay away from anything that's proprietary um uh so that way you can actually use the filters of your choice it that and again like getting into a whole map box and all the filters like that is a those are pretty big pills to swallow uh, but they will last you for the rest of your career. The mad box that I yeah. use is the wooden camera one. Um, so I was going back to wooden camera. Uh, but I, <laughs> I actually got this used a few years back, and it still um, suited my needs. Actually, if I can uh, get into here, get fancy like Jeremy. Whoa, okay, here we go. All right, all right. All right, <laughs> all right. so this is the, my wooden camera one that I've used uh, for a couple years, and uh, it served me well. Uh, Bright Tangerine also makes some really good mad boxes. Uh, what other brands are, are, are pretty solid mad boxes? Aerie is obviously a standard. Aerie. Yeah, Aerie's good. Um, um, O'Connor, I mean, that's old school. I don't even think they make those anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you can find a used O'Connor, you know, that's a good deal, too. But that's if you're working on bigger productions, obviously, like with bigger rigs. Yeah, I, I think... But Aerie. I think in uh, in terms of uh, actual filters to help with uh, IR, I think the Firecrest did pretty good. The the Kinas were obviously very good. Um, and if you need a if you need a sweet deal, you know, hit me up. I could probably uh, hook up some sort of deal there if you're if you're looking mm -hmm. to up your uh, filtration game. But um, 
Let's see, Ray's got another question. Uh, when running and gunning, do you like your cam rig to be heavy or light? Uh, medium on the heavy side. Yeah, maybe That's maybe maybe a slight tendency towards heavy. Um, yeah. Again, going back to stability, it helps there. Uh, but you don't want something that's just like carrying around a 50 pound dumbbell like everywhere. That would suck. Um, that would suck. For me, Easy. like on my FX9s, I most of the time I just rock them just the body only. And with that, that's probably the, with the lens, it's probably not even 10 pounds. So, um, and obviously handling a body of that size and style is a little bit more easier than something like this. Um, so I would say maybe somewhere from the, Seven to ten pound range is probably a good, yeah, happy, say happy, so. happy medium. Once you get into like the 15s and 20s, then it's like, man, do I really gotta freaking carry this thing around everywhere? Um, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd say, you know, plus or minus, you know, in the tent. Which is why I, yeah, I, I personally like to operate with like an fs7 style rig or like fx9 or fs5 even because you literally have everything you need built into it where internal nds you know uh xlr ports with phantom power and stuff like that like the, literally if you have internal nds and uh phantom power you're pretty much set for the majority of like basic stuff yeah that'll that'll get you a long way uh deanne wants a hookup so yeah if you need a hookup Send me an email or something. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get you uh, connected to, with the right people. <laughs> uh, but, Jeremy, in terms of your rig, uh, is there anything else you want to kind of show, showcase, or how, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm pretty good. I'm packing into my case because I actually want to show you how I pack it into oh, my case. Oh, well, let's just let's go back to what, what tenant is that, number two? No, mm -hmm. that's no, tenant number three, modularity. Yeah. Being easily packable. So what do we got here? So... See how, like, this whole time we're talking, I'm able to just pull these parts off quickly with no tools? He's That's going. the point. He's moving. That's the point. Someone start the timer. <laughs> Don't start the timer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is the one thing about my rig, personally, is since I do use the production module a lot, that lives on the camera. So anytime I do have to switch out the basic spanner, I have to use the red tool, which is... You know, I'm nitpicking here, but yeah, you have to turn it off. <laughs> you know, first world problems, right? It's always about first world problems. Um, yeah. Is your is your case gonna be able to fit on your table or no? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. It's a Pelican. What is it? It's a 1560. Yeah, 1560, which is like my favorite size. Um, because it's big enough to fit, you know, the majority of like small docu rigs like this or small cinema packages with all the accessories, but it also only has two latches on the front versus like the 1650, which has two latches on the front and then two more on the side, which two more latches. I mean, you might think, yeah, it's only two latches, but like if you're moving fast and you're doing shit, like it adds up. That's my personal experience. Like I like to minimize like you really have to think about what you're doing to be able to minimize time wasters that build up so time just, wasters yeah just think about it there's no right answer to anything it's the only right answer is you know what you figure out for yourself yeah i mean that's the whole point of you know all these videos and these streams these videos what all this content is basically you know not my my workflow, Jeremy's workflow. Not saying that it's going to 100% translate one to one for you, um, and that's kind of mm -hmm. what this is all this is all about: is finding out what works for you, and kind of delivering on you know just an, an easy workflow that works for you. Yeah. Um, Kevin is saying that he just got the FX9, uh, the extension unit, and a gold mount with the Shogun Seven. So how are you? Uh, how are you? How are you using a gold mount? Do you have uh, like a D box or something? That's what I did. I, I uh, have a D box that goes from V mount to gold mount. So, uh, yeah, that'd be uh, interesting. It, interested to to hear what you think about that. I I don't know anyone that has the extension unit. Um, I would love to try one out. Um, mm -hmm. But that's cool. Yeah, I mean the only reason we had the extension unit for the FS7 was for time code. 
um, and now which we don't even I need still it. have on mine. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, with right that X9, on body. we don't even need. We, don't, we already have time codes. So uh, how yeah, do you I mean, use gold mount? <laughs> I'm interested in hearing uh, what was the main Kevin. If you don't mind sharing, what was what were the main uh, uh, selling points for you in, in getting the extension unit um, as an FX9 owner? So let me know. Uh, Ray did not get the back. I don't have the back either, Ray. Um, I don't see myself needing it. Uh, but, again, I would love to try one still. All right, so Jeremy's nearing completion. All right, let's see. All right, let's moment of truth, see if it fits. Like a really small mic. case on camera. Well, in the grand scheme of things, it is a small case. I mean, yeah, it's it's a tidy boy. All right, so Pelican 1650. Whoa. All right. So I'm a big fan of these Tenba, like, BYOB, like, bring your own bag type. Uh, inserts. This one is the, well, you can see that, the insert number nine, um, especially in combination with the track pack, because track pack, you know, you can do a square and then this just fits right inside snugly to hold the monitor. EVF goes in here and it's covered to prevent dust to go into the, the, the glass. Uh, production module lives on the body and I just literally have it sitting in its own pocket there. Um, the broadcast plate sits here and then the EVF just slides in here. All of the handle and rail accessories go in here and it just fits nicely. Moose bars are at the bottom and the handles, uh, the grips are right there. This is why I love the Camera Essentials cable pouch is because it literally just slides into its own little slot here. Uh, mini mags go into like a Tiffin filter case just because that's what I had lying around and it it's also thin so that I can slide it right next to the cable essentials pouch. Power brick, um, PL mount, card reader. I mean all of this can be tidier but this is just what I had on hand to just stuff in that corner. Um, the inserts specifically I love because they come with these flaps which sometimes I don't use as a topper like this but I'll use it as cushioning on the inside to kind of like form around accessories that I need to fit and there you go it all fits into one neat little case boom Sorry, and that's a 1560 yeah 1560 yeah that's and tiny. notice how like the only latches are the two front ones and it opens, so I can just open it in one go. Rather than the 1650, have two latches up here, and then I think two more on each side. So yeah, or what you can a total get a, of six latches. a 1610 too, which I think has just one on each side. Yeah, which is what that one is, or I think that's a 1650 back there. 1610. Yeah, 1610. Sorry. So we have a couple questions on uh, flying with gear. I have flown with gear so much. Um, and we have a question regarding uh, whether you should check on check in your baggage. Um, Deanne is asking, when I'm traveling with gear on a, a flight f uh, for a project, um, what do I carry on and what do I risk for baggage? Um, so this can go a bunch of different ways. Uh, some production companies I know, they'll always check their packages. Um, I used to not do that. I, you know, it honestly depends. If I'm bringing out a, if I'm able to bring something up with me on the plane, obviously I will. Batteries always need to go up with you on the plane. Um, so that's another factor to consider too. So any sort of like lithium battery needs to go above the cargo hold. Um, so whatever bag or whatever case you are bringing with you, make sure you can accommodate your batteries with you. Um, if I'm bringing, like right now, I have a two camera FX9 package that lives in like a 1610. Um, I'll, some, I'll usually check that. Um, 
I I'm lucky in that I've never had I've never lost uh, a knock on wood. Yeah, I've I've never lost a piece of luggage or you know I've it, it just gets a little dicey if you're if you're somewhere that's you know where your flights are delayed where your bags have made it but you didn't make the flight or vice versa if you made the flight and your your bags are left behind. Um, that usually gets me a little stressed, especially if I have a quick connection. Um, but a lot of times, um, it, it, it all depends. It, it depends on what, how many cameras and how many pieces of equipment I'm bringing. Um, but for the most part, I do feel somewhat safe in checking baggages. My, our cinematography mentor, uh, Waldman, Professor Waldman, mm -hmm. I know he checks his, his, his lenses. What lenses, yeah, what is, lenses does he have? He has a whole set. The, yeah, the entire set of Sumalux C from Leica. Yeah. He took a second mortgage out for it. It's like, what, 300 grand. Yeah, he owns a whole set, and uh, he checks those. He throws those under the, under the plane. So, um, And, of course, everything's insured, obviously. Like, all my gear is insured. So um, it, just, mm -hmm. it obviously just depends. So for, like, obviously all the lights and all the extra knickknacks and doodads those will go under but if you can bringing the camera and bringing like a lens or two up with you is is usually a good idea um but in the cases where i'm i'm bringing out a bunch of stuff um i'll probably check stuff under so yeah uh the inserts for the trek pack are the tenba uh, i think you need to adjust exposure uh, on that you're right there we go. The Tenba BYOB inserts. This one is specifically the insert number nine. Um, and these are inserts meant to go inside of another bag. Uh, so what I usually like to do is take it and then tuck the top, because this zips closed like this. It's almost like a little mini ice cooler thing. Um, but take this and tuck it into the back pocket here. So it's literally just a rectangular insert that I can just place. Um, and I specifically like that for Trek Pack inside of Pelican cases because it just fits nicely in those squares. In the in our Tenba bags, though, like what I usually like to do is use these uh, toolboxes from Tenba. So this fits all the tentacles, sink boxes. Um, and the cool thing about these is that each size kind of fits a certain Pelican model, too. So this size is the toolbox number four, and this fits nicely uh lengthwise inside of a tenba suitcase but for example this one which you know fits my lobs so it's a mess right now because i was using the lobs uh but this one specifically closes it's the toolbox number six and once it's closed it fits literally perfectly height wise in a standard like carry-on suitcase that's tidy Yep. Actually, Jeremy's Jeremy's got all the all the, all the hacks for for bags and uh, and packing. So, this one is the toolbox number four holds NPF batteries, but uh, this is a Pelican 1510. You know the standard Pelican carry-on case. Lengthwise, if you turn it like this, it just fits nicely like that right on top and it closes with the lid um, and let me see let me see here oh, so this is going, the, you got jeremy going on on bags now yeah man i i fucking love bags and cases but this is the uh previous um what, 1560 so in my sound kit and this applies to even camera kits too but sound bag fits on top and uh, the toolbox number six fits perfectly vertical inside of a 1560 uh, size and it fits like literally flush with the top of the case so that when you close it there's no issue so there you go quick quick bags 101 there
Awesome, I love it. I love, uh, I, I don't know, I, we have like a very fond, uh, like effect, like we're very affectionate towards our bags and what we use for cases, so uh, we love it. Um, cool. Guys, your rig. You know, camera rigging 101 doesn't stop with just the rig. You know, it's all about the bags too. All right, so I think with that, I'll get into my rig. Um, uh, let's see, I'm addicted, to, uh, Zach is saying, uh, I'm addicted to bags and cases, everything, everything has its own place. I love, I love when everything has, especially when I go into my garage and look at all my gear, everything has its own little place. I love it. Um, cool, so I'm gonna get into my rig. Let's see, actually, Jeremy, do you have one more thing? No, nope, that's it. What do you got, what do you got, you got a little something there? No, this is the BYOB insert. Okay. <laughs> I just. You're just so addicted to it. You're just hanging <laughs> on to it. Uh, <laughs> Kippy, yeah, we have a few uh, Pelican cases uh, between the two of us. She's, a she's, few. Just see what my equipment rack looks like. It's uh, it's no joke. It's no joke. Nice rack. Let's see. Andy's asking, uh, are we using any other Tenba bags other than that roller? Debating on getting one of Tenba's doctor bags to keep the camera built up. Well. It just so happens that between the two of us, we have like, what, four of those doctor bags? Uh, yeah. And those actually are our original uh, camera bags. We, we use those for a while. And uh, for actually, that's where my FS7 uh, rigs are just living right now. Uh, but those doctor bags are great, especially when mm -hmm. you want to leave your camera semi built. Um, and they, they have a lot of space, too, a lot of, a lot yeah. of space. So and that ties back to the camera rigging, where if all your accessories are quick release on NATO rails or on 15 mil rails or rods and stuff like that, you can when you place it in those doctor bags, you can quickly take the viewfinder off or the monitor off and just tuck it on the side. So for me personally, right now my bags, I'm for for something like a A7, so I I can fit, I can you know two whole packages into a roller. So for Cameras of these size, I'd probably use something like a roller so I can fit like lenses, batteries, and all that stuff in there. Um, wh whereas if I'm using something like an FX9, FS7, maybe something a little bit more substantial where I can, where I can actually leave built, so I'd maybe go with a Dr. Bag route. We love bags. Mm -hmm. Ten bus, sponsor us, please. We'll please. Look, we'll be looking out. All right, so I'm going to get into my rig here. Um, so if I, I can go ahead and switch my angle right there. So this is what right, what we, you got. We, this is what we've got. We've got the uh, you know the coveted A7S III camera that everyone look at it. Everyone's trying to get their hands on. Um, I love this camera. Um, it's great. Again, I, I'm planning on doing um, a rig video uh, probably sometime next week. It's basically everything that you're going to be seeing in this in the stream. Um, it's just a, it's just a more condensed version. Uh, but we did shoot a commercial with this at my gym. Uh, when was that? Last weekend? About, about a yeah. week ago. Um, and it was great. So this is basically the configuration that we use. So I'll go ahead and build it out. Um, so to start off, this is the wooden camera cage. Uh, it's actually their unified uh, small cage, I believe. Um, and this is a, obviously a Manfrotto uh, standard uh, which is, you know, good and bad. It's, it's nice because I can just you know, throw this on any, mostly any tripod. Um, but then this connects to the actual uh, bottom plate here. And then I can lock this in. And then here I have, I'm able to add rails. And then this is nice because this, um, if I didn't have this, the rails would be sitting right at the bottom of the camera. And so this is a nice kind of spacer to give me extra real estate for rails. Um, let's see. And then... Uh, with that, oh, and also another thing about this, um, in wood cameras, older cages, they would actually have a cold shoe clamp. So the reason that this is uncovered now is because a lot of the newer Sony cameras um, have a uh, multi-interface shoe where you can hook in audio, you know, you can mm -hmm. set up mics here with no cable list, which is kind of really nice. Um, so that's why they, you don't see that clamp here. Um, you know, it's a good and a bad thing because a lot of, like, we actually prefer, me and Jeremy, we actually prefer the clamps because if you notice, if you kind of look closely, I, there is a little bit of give there. I can maybe yeah. uh, get you there. I don't know if you can see that at all, but there is just the tiniest bit of flex, and especially when you're, if your rig is all done out and built out right here and you have your top handle, you might notice a little bit of flexing, um, but in most situations, yeah. it's, it's not a big deal. You only notice it when it gets heavier, because when you lift up the camera by the top handle, it flexes out. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
if that's an issue for you and you want a clamp, if you see my angle, I also have the same top plate, but I also have an additional um, uh, wooden camera makes this little attachment that slides onto the shoe and it bolts on. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Yeah, so it just bolts on, and it's the same top light, but it just adds an additional point of contact. Also, Small Rig makes these little cold shoe attachments. I fucking love them because they lock on using the airy locating pin standard. If I can get this off to show you. I have, like, fucking, I don't know, 20 of these um, just because they're super useful for quickly attaching. Again, like, use um, if you had a shotgun mic, it attaches at a right angle loading locating pin it's great for wooden camera stuff because they have plenty of locating pin stuff so yeah go ahead sorry rob <laughs> no good i love it i love it um yeah and 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 obviously you can probably find a lot of this stuff um a lot of these parts and accessories you'll more than likely be able to find a small rig equivalent so um if you want to buy small rig stuff then go ahead and buy small rig stuff it's it's cheap it's easily accessible so um more, more often than not, you'll be able to find some sort of small rig alternative to basically everything I'm showing today. So, uh, going back, uh, we have our uh, camera, cage, we have a bottom plate. So, the first thing I'll do is I'll just throw on some rails. These are aluminum rails, um, also from one camera. Super sturdy, <laughs> um, also kind of heavy. But with a camera this size, um, I don't really mind because um, with, with the camera this size and the camera this light, I kind of want that added weight and that added stability. So, um, and these are, I believe, 12 inch rods. Um, so actually I'll do something probably like that. Mr. Uh, Mr. B, thanks for your comment there. And let me uh, see if I can load that up. <laughs> you guys are super experienced and knowledgeable for your age. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Also, how do you know how old I am? I could be like 60. I'm actually 55. Okay. Um, so, moving on. Um, let's actually build out the rear end of the camera. So, to start off, we have um, this guy. This is basically you're just basic rod clamp. You can get a uh, kind of small rig. I think it's just called rod clamp. Um, and I have a gold mount plate with a dummy battery come out, coming out from the side. Um, so this is just bolted onto the rod clamp, and the, that way I can slide it onto my rails. My rails here. Do something like that. Nope, oh, wrong way. And then also I've removed the uh, battery door cover. So if you can see there, right here, there's no battery door. So that way I can just kind of slip in this battery. Um, it would be cool, some cameras like they have a little hole that you can leave the battery door actually attached and this, their dummy battery wire can actually just kind of uh, sneak on through. Uh, but in, in Sony's events, in Sony's case, um, there's no such thing. So kind of moving on backwards, I will add this guy. Now this guy is just basically a bracket to hold a Teradek uh, transmitter. So this is a uh, 3000 XT uh, transmitter. So actually what I'll do is I can attach the antenna to the top. And also, this, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, notice Ray Shoots said, I recommend never check in the camera, too much at stake. Um, one little note about that is if you can, um, depending on your situation, what I usually advise is to figure out what parts go in what bag that you check or carry on so that by the time you do get to your location everything that you need like just basic stuff the bare minimum to be able to shoot with is in your carry-on so if you have to you know squeeze your audio stuff into an care or in a to a check bag or all your other accessories but at, as long as you have like a few memory cards the body itself and a lens in your carry-on you should be good to go and i know some people who you know, they travel to a gig and they, they're bringing like a larger cinema camera or a documentary style camera, but they have smaller body like the A7S3s inside of the carry-on just in case one of their check bags goes missing. They can still shoot with their carry-on. 
Yeah, so, having again, a backup. Just thinking is, about bags. Having a backup is is never a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, moving on, I kind of um, so you know as you can notice, these are basically pass through plates. So these have a gold mount, uh, female and male end on basically each side. So that way, I'm kind of able to sandwich everything towards the back of this rig. Um, so this Teradek bracket is basically passing through power to this side. So that way, when I attach something onto this end, also another gold mount receiver, um, everything is just passed through. So I just have one battery mm -hmm. powering uh, basically these two accessories, passing on power to this plate, which is passing on power to the camera. And so this is the Teradek. And then this is actually a C-Box, um, also from one camera. One camera needs to sponsor me. Um, <laughs> So this is a C-Box. So th basically this is, uh, I like to think of it as a converter box. So what this will do is this will take your input. Um, this will take your signal, and this will redistribute it. Um, it gives you SDI. It gives you a couple HDMIs. Uh, but one of the big features that, you know, that's really important for, for pro-level cameras is just being able to get a vi video signal out from your camera. So that's why this is really important. So this way I can feed this into another monitor, um, I can feed this into the, my Teradek. I can feed this into, you know, I have one, two, three, four, five um, outputs here. Um, whereas if I just use the A7S body, this would just obviously just be the one HDMI. So um, a little bit easier to work, especially when you're, you know, you're talking about working with larger crews, you need more video signals um, so that everyone can see the picture. So um, that's how I have this kind of outfitted. It's just kind of sandwiched on. It's a nice little gold, so, gold mount sandwich. Yeah, that's another interesting note that you can't. It's harder to do that with V mount because on with the V mount design, it nat like if you have a male and female end on either side of it, it naturally um, goes gets taller the further back you get. But with gold mount, everything, all the studs are in line, no matter where you are in the sandwich. And I have noticed that this the the C box does drop down a little bit. Um, if you can notice, like. Here's where yeah. this plate is. And that's why I leave the C-Box at the ends. So that way, this one drops down a little further. Um, and then, so, all right, what else? Let's put on the MDR. So this is the uh, MDR uh, for the Teradek RT. So this is what actually drives the, uh, te the Teradek RT motors. So basically, on Jeremy's camera, you saw the, the ACI. And this is basically for what you would use on every other camera. So as you can see here, we have all the different uh, connection, or connections for ports there, power, camera control. Um, so the best, the, the way I've kind of rigged, rigged this out on this camera is I'll just put it right on this top plate here. And then uh, I have a bolt that I got from good old Home Depot, Lowe's. Lowe's. <laughs> And then I'll just kind of attach this right to the top plate here. And I really like this motor driver because it's really thin, really low profile, um, doesn't take up a lot of space. Normally, I'd like to hang it off the side, but there's not a lot of mounting um, accessibility off the side of the camera here. Um, so that's why I kind of just sandwich it right on the top. Uh, let's see, got a couple more comments. The Technopilot says, let's be honest here, there are some high-end Manfrotto tripods and heads that match uh, and equal the Sokla FSB10 in terms of performance. They just aren't that many. I agree, yeah. I'm not saying they don't exist, uh, but most of the times I encounter a, uh, most of the times I counter a Manfrotto, uh, it's not that. So <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's all I have to say. <laughs> um, another question here. Uh, how do we get insurance on our gear? So I go through a company called uh, TCP Insurance, um, and that way I have general liability. I, you know, it's basically just business insurance, um, but they also insure your actual equipment in case it's stolen or you know a tragic event happens and you lose all your gear. Um, you know, that's what insurance is for. Jeremy, do you have uh, insurance, or, or what's up with that? Uh, I do. It's through Ismahawk, L, you know, our my company. Um, we use Studio Binder actually as a hub for our uh, like production stuff for call sheets and you know um, scripts, revisions, stuff like that. And so Studio Binder actually offers their own version of insurance because I think they're also a broker and it's I think it's called Abacus. 
So that's what we do. So, yeah. Yeah, Ray actually brings up a good point, too. So, like, obviously, we have our own insurance um, that covers our own gear and all that stuff. But also, it's important that whenever you go out on a job with gear, it's important to get insurance from them. So that way, if anything happens to your gear, you're not liable for any of that stuff happening. So if anything happens yeah. under production's watch, then you would be taking the hit on your insurance rate, on your premium or whatever. Um, whereas if you have a certificate of insurance, a COI, from production, if anything happens, you can make a claim through their insurance, and then they'll have to pay for it. So Yeah, and that's usually more common if you're letting your gear go. Like, if it leaves your hands to go on set as a rental, you would need a COI from production so that you're covered. Yeah, Ray makes another great point, though. Um, any, anyone that has over 10K plus of gear should have insurance. Get insurance. Mm -hmm. Just got to do it. And, you know, TCP, when I first got TCP, it wasn't as expensive as I, as I thought it would be. So super important. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Mr. B, talking about what happened to Philip Bloom. Did you see that, Jeremy? Yeah. Oh, my God. I feel bad. <laughs> Man, I feel for that guy for sure. Yeah. Um, I haven't... I haven't been keeping up to date. I don't know if his insurance company is going to be uh, uh, covering all that, but man, that sucks. I am so lucky that I've never had an incident uh, with my car, some my car being broken into, my van, Knock on wood. my van or anything being broken into. Uh, Jeremy, have you any ever had any experiences with that? Nope. Same. I've been very fortunate to not have that happen. Man, especially you know he had his he well he did get another uh, Ronin, but the A7S III and uh, man. He didn't lose his footage, though, because he actually backed it up there on a go. NAR box. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Tighten right. All right. Tighten right. Go back to this rig. Let me uh, go there. Perfect. All right. So in terms of lenses, um, for the commercial, we were rocking uh, my Vista Primes. It was uh, Vista Prime time. Oh. It's my favorite time. Right there. And my Vista Primes are an EF mount, so... We got a trusty old Metabones. We were talking about Metabones earlier. Mm -hmm. So I'll throw this guy on. And if I was trying to get really spicy, I would, uh, right under here, um, there is a way to actually uh, clamp the Metabones adapter to the um, actual base plate. I don't know, it's kind of hard to see. You can kind of see, maybe see it there. Um, but like right here, there's a little rod, and you would just insert that in, and that would kind of clamp in this this uh, adapter. But we're using a, uh, a lens support, so not something that I'm terribly concerned about. Uh, let's see. Ray says uh, that he's had it happen. Oh, whoop, skipped one. Ray says I've had it happen once. That's why I think it's silly when people have their company names on the outside of their personal rides. Yeah, uh, that's exactly why. You'll my van is a. Uh, a white unmarked van. I have a uh, creepy van, um, <laughs> and I got a fed here. I, I like to keep it that way. Uh, let's see. Android Tech is asking, "What camera do I use?" So for this camera, we're rocking an FX9. For this camera, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is also an FX9. So I'm rocking both FX9s. Uh, Jeremy, what about you? What are you using? Uh. This one, the main camera, is an FS7, and then this one is the A7S3. Oh, gosh. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So I'm rocking basically all FX9s. Um, I would be using the uh, A7Ss if I actually lent my other one to Jeremy so he could uh, do the stream yeah. with me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get it wrong. This is not my A7S3. <laughs> it, it, it looks great. It looks great. Okay, so we have that. Uh, we have that. Um, now it kind of comes down to cabling um, and going back to cable management, making things tidy. So what I will do is uh, first, also, so I use an external monitor with this rig. Um, this is the 503. Um, I love this monitor. I've had it for a few years. I have the 703 that I use as a director's monitor, also great. Um, kind of expensive, but what you get, I mean, they're super, their colors are great, uh, especially when they're calibrated. Uh, daylight viewable, especially when you're talking about here in, in the Vegas summer, in a desert in the summer, having something that's daylight viewable is super important. And the way I actually mount it is uh, through Zacuto. So this is the, um, this is Zacuto's like, I forget what it's called. Do you remember what this is called, Jeremy? The little rod adapter? 
Uh, it's the 15 rod mount for the American arm. Yeah, so the arm itself is, is called the American arm or a Z arm. And I, I don't know if they discontinue these or not. This is the shorter version. I love yeah. these arms because they use 15 mil rods um, mm -hmm. instead of having to use a quarter 20 thread. Um, these yeah. are so much more reliable and they're, they just they just stick. So basically, yeah. if you get an arm, sometimes I think you have to buy this separate. Uh, comes with this guy you can and this comes with either a uh, three ace or quarter inch i believe uh, screw that you can put into another monitor or wherever so this obviously is in this monitor yeah I'll put this in the rod and then clamp this down so they all they they also make a version with the uh, nato rail ends too so on if you look at mine um the uh small rig makes little nato attachments for the anti-twist pins for small HD monitors, and it's a NATO standard. So if you use the Kudos uh, American arm, the Z arm, with the NATO standard, uh, it just easily locks and slides into NATO rails. So same thing, same concept. Zerko mounts. I think the are those, are those the new ones you're talking about, Andy? The new Zakudo mounts. Um, but yeah, no, I I love these uh these, these 15 mil ones because yeah. you find them everywhere. Um, so what I love about this is that these are just especially you have a lot of a lot of torque here in just this knob, so you can really just crank down on this. And even if it's leaning, you know, out all the way, I can crank this all the way down. And it ultimately depends on what's clamping onto your 15 millimeter rod here. So. Um, yeah, that you know that holds when our arm is straight out. So. Mm -hmm. okay. um, also, another note for cable management: if you guys haven't heard of Sprig, I mean, this is some some of the bougie shit, <laughs> but Sprig makes little uh, these little plastic inserts that screw. I don't know if you can see that. Um, they screw into quarter twenty or three eighths pins. And it's literally just like a little loop for your cables. Yeah, those are tidy. It's hard to see. Yeah, so it's just a little flexible plastic loop that you can just loop your cables through. Yeah, and, and those things are really nice to have, especially when you're talking about accessories. You know, you're talking about here, I'm going to have a power cable, I'm going to have a video cable, I'm going to have a motor cable, I'm going to have another power cable for this. Um, so having something that's easily, you know, routable is, will help a lot too. Zycro mounts. That's what they're called. Ah, Zycro mounts. There you go. It's been so long since I bought one, I forgot what they were called. Yeah, they last forever. <laughs> yeah, I have about three of these and I have, I have the small arm. Um, I have this, this is the small arm. I have another longer arm when I'm, you know, doing more easy rig stuff. Uh, I love these for easy rig stuff because they, they're just super solid. I never have to worry about them unthreading or any other BS, so they're great. Actually, the, the video that we shot, that was basically how I, this is how I rocked it on the easy rig, so there you go. So then I'll just kind of route these, and then um, to kind of keep things tidy, I'll actually just use the arm. I'll actually affix these cables and kind of cable tie them to the arm and kind of have them drop down so everything's not... Just hanging out everywhere. So, so let me go ahead and plug this guy in. And that's also so, another great thing about using the sandwich is that now I essentially have a D box because I have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, D taps out of here. So Andy's asking a, a question that I was actually about to bring up to you: um, coiled cables versus regular cables with cable management. Um, uh, yeah. Regular. Yeah. Why, so why are you using coiled cable on your rig? Um, <laughs> to be honest, it's because this is like an optimal length for me. A lot of it comes down to length. I do like straight cables, but it's harder because I don't own a ton of smaller length uh, cables. But these are really nice and easy to adapt to to multiple angles, as you can see. You can kind of stretch them out. Um, but you know, kind of short answer. It's because it's kind of it was an optimal length for this particular rig. So, 
But in terms of cable managing, the regular straight cables are probably a little bit more easier to cable manage. You just kind of have to be really precise with, with uh, what length you get. Yeah. Um, my, I'm, I'm regular cables all the way. I hate coiled cables. <laughs> I absolutely detest them just because you basically have a long ass cable and you're carrying the, that entire weight of that cable. Um, obviously it works on your rig because, you know, your monitor is on an articulating arm, which means you need to modify the length of your cables, like the length of where it needs to go often. I don't, which is why if you noticed on my rig, all my accessories are hard mounted. There's no articulating stuff on it, um, where cables are involved. So I honestly regular cables all the way, but that also means you buy a lot more cables. So I have like varying lengths of every cable imaginable. So, um, I just pick the right length for the right rig, honestly. And you're spending more money, yes, but now I have an, like, if you have one cable, you have none. If you have two or more, then, you know, you have backups. There you go. You love to, you love to hear it. Um, let's see, what else do I need? I need a, to power the motor driver, so I will use, actually, power the tear deck. Also, cable extensions sometimes are a lifesaver for me personally because because i don't use coiled cables just having like short extensions uh can save your rig just before a job because you know sometimes you need to rig a certain way and the your current regular cable doesn't quite reach you, using a like six inch or a 12 inch extension is just enough to get that cable where it needs to go yeah, and modularity. Modularity. All right, this kind of fell apart on me. So yeah. what do you use to uh, kind of wrangle your cables? Uh, so I use a couple different things. I use a combination of gear ties and uh, just straight up Velcro uh, cable management. So these are actually really cool. These are called gear ties. Um, so they're basically kind of rubberized, like flexible uh, ties nice. um, that kind of coil really nicely, especially if you get it, like a good coil around a, a handful of cables. They kind of really tidy things up and kind of make everything look really neat. So sometimes I'll use these. Other times for when I when I need kind of a, a thicker. Uh, more length. I'll just base. I'll use some a good old fashioned uh, Velcro ties. So yeah, you know, it's just a combination of th combination of the two. So yeah. I'm gonna go from. And if you guys haven't used Dual Lock, check out Dual Lock. They're like uh, they're also made by 3M because you know 3M makes Velcro too. Um, but it's like the much more low profile version of the normal Velcro that you're used to seeing. Um, but yeah, check out dual lock, dual lock. Dual Sorry, I can't lock. say. It. All right, let's see what else do I got. So to actually get the video feed out, um, here is the HDMI. So what I'll do is I will. Let's see, I'm trying to remember how I rigged this. Had this rigged. It goes this way. So for this uh, configuration, I had a, a right angle HDMI cable, and this was going up. And then the, how I did it was I kind of looped it around, so kind of keeping the going along the lines of the actual camera body. And then what I did is I actually kind of clamped the front part of the cable to the cage right here, so that then that way I'm not kind strain of strain relief. Yeah, putting any excess strain on the actual port. So this can kind of go out and around. And then from here, I have another one. This is basically just a uh, female to male, but it's got kind of kind of like a flexible, kind of a short flexible cable in the middle of it. So that way, I'm able to, because this this cable wasn't just long enough. So this way, I'm able to put that in, and then the input is right down here. So that way, I'm able to plug in to that. So, and then I'll usually just kind of tuck this away and hide that in. 
And then what else in terms of additional cables? Um, actually, let me throw a lens on so I can get that mo motor on. What's up, Jordan? How's it going? Welcome to the stream. Thanks for uh, coming by. So, Vista Prime, Vista Prime time, my favorite kind of time. <laughs> um, these look incredible on this camera. Um, the footage that we got from this gym commercial, I'm really excited to share, um, just because I think these lenses pair really well with kind of larger format uh, cameras, full frame and and beyond. Um, Jeremy, how did you think they looked? <laughs> they got that Vista look. They got that Vista Which is something look. I really like. Yeah, they're super nice. Um, especially when you can utilize kind of larger sensors. Um, the, f the, mm -hmm. the, the fall off characteristics have, are, it's. Yeah, it's a very distinctive fall off, it's especially a... when you're shooting close to wide open, like, you know, at a two or something. Yeah, two, there, two, there's eight. something about it that, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can uh, interview Ryan Avery from Tokina and, talk a little bit more about these lenses, but um, I do love me some Vista Primes. All right, so we got the yeah. lens on there. Um, actually, one thing I'll do is I will throw over here. This is the Teradoc RT. I did a review on these guys, super powerful motors. Um, this is actually an extension arm, so that way you can actually reposition where the motor actually uh, lands. Um, because if I were just to mount these motors right on the, uh, the 15 millimeter rods, it would land right about here, but you can see that, I'm just gonna lay it down. You can see that this would be fall below where the, the dovetail would be, so it, you, I wouldn't be able to ha let the camera sit flat. So by using this extension arm, I'm able to put the arm on and then the, the motor, so the motor sits a little bit higher so you can get a little bit more optimal torque. Uh, DN, yeah, I'm still rocking the FS7, and it does do 4K 10-bit 422 internal in XAVC I. So, uh, Jeremy, talk a little bit about more. Uh, talk a little bit about um, whether now is a good time to to get into an FS7 or not. Um, I personally think if you're if you don't need autofocus, the FS7 still works great. Um. I would recommend waiting to see what the FX6 will look like uh, when it comes out because it honestly might be cheaper than a used FS7. You're, and it you're does. kind of maybe potentially looking at one of those, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I would personally use the autofocus a lot, but that would also mean I would need to invest in Sony glass, and I don't have any. I actually have uh, all my stuff is Canon mount, EF mount. So, I mean, you can obviously adapt those to the FS, FX6, um, but you're missing out on the autofocus, really. Um, the, the only thing about the FS7 that I would see be an issue if you were to jump in it on it now is just, like, its form factor, personally, because if you need time code and you want to use gold mounts or V-mounts, you would need the extension back for it, um, which adds a major amount of bulk, which I don't understand why Sony's extension backs are so gigantic for what it does. Uh, but yeah, if, if you need time code, then you would need the, the extension back for the extension unit, and that obviously like adds on a more significant chunk of the cost. But if you don't need that, then yeah, the FS7 body is perfect for, you know, just run and gun stuff because it's still, like, the image is still great. And if you're shooting log, um, grade your footage, first of all. Uh, and it just teaches you a lot on how to use documentary-style cameras. People will complain about the menu system. They'll complain about the button menu. Like, the menu layout and the button layout. Like, yeah, there are a lot of buttons, but spend some time with it, and it's muscle memory at that point. All right, so I got my motor on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add my lens supports. And when I'm using something like a Teradek RT, uh, super powerful motors, if I didn't have the lens support, the lens would be flexing up and down. And you'll, you'll notice that mm -hmm. when uh, your first is pulling. Yeah. Um, as for the autofocus for the FS7, what you're looking at on my like front angle, that's, uh, what is that, a Sony 3514, Sony Zeiss. 
Um, and I have autofocus enabled. The only downside to that is that it's just like a center zone that it focuses on. And it works fine for like this kind of stuff where I'm just sitting in front of the camera. But if you're doing like mission critical interviews and stuff like that, like that kind of corporate work where, you know, subjects aren't used to being in front of the camera, they tend to lean back and forth. Um, having eye tracking autofocus is a lifesaver and eye tracking autofocus versus just the center zone type autofocus is huge, huge difference, huge difference. Right, we gotta, Ooh, we Adonis. Go. <laughs> Adonis asks, what do you think about the wave of new cube style cameras, like the Panasonic GH1 um, and Red Komodo and stuff? I personally love that style. Like the new Canon C70, like, damn, that's looking spicy. Just because it's, uh, it, again, modular. Like, <laughs> right, the right build for the right job kind of deal. And with the red Komodo and the C70 with Canon and the, um, uh, the, the new Panasonic one, like, it just helps you. Like, I like that style because, well, one, I think most of them don't have the screen on the back. And if you notice the way that I operate and what I see a lot of people do now is they operate at the hip or, like, at elbow height. If you have the screen on the back, like, you know, the A7S III, um, now has a flip out screen so you can actually look down at the screen but if the screen or the monitor or the EVF is right on the back of the camera like you can't attach it's not easy to attach more accessories to the back of it so having cube style cameras like it's so much easier to build out a rig from that I personally think obviously everyone is different everyone's rig is different GBH1 that's what it was in Panasonic also, if you guys are jumping into like that kind of um, like a step up from DSLRs or mirrorless, uh, take a good look at the C70 because that looks really interesting. The C70 does look really interesting. If like if I were, you know, I don't know, I got enough cameras, but if I were looking to yeah step up my uh, corporate game or whatever, you know, jumping up from a mirrorless body, that would be something I'd probably start looking at. So Rob. Zach asks, why would you put a full rig on the A7S III instead of using, you know, the FX9 or, or RED? That is a great, great question. I ask myself this every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the reason I, I have this rigged out is because, well, we one, we recently just shot a commercial with this. Um, and two, again, I, I never plan on using this camera in this kind of configuration um, with all the extra doodads and knickknacks. Um, it was mostly because if I were to bring this camera out in a production environment, uh, this is probably how I would send it out with, you know, you got a C-Box, you tear deck, you know, all, you know, all the things. You know, that being said, we're starting, that's a, you make a great point. We're starting to enter kind of FX9 area. And in the video that I'm going to be putting out probably next week, um, you actually, I'm actually going to compare prices on, you know, what this setup looks like as to compared to an FX9. Um, but you know, long story long, um, it was. I basically wanted to see how this handled in a kind of in a product, in a commercial environment, in a production setting, and I basically just wanted to, you know, again, not fight the camera, and I wanted to have, uh, I wanted to have a director's monitor. I wanted to have a, a first AC. Jeremy was pulling for me on that commercial, um, and uh, there is something to be said about actually interfacing with the camera. When you're working with a crew, um, so if I am, if I am working with a larger crew, this is probably what I would, this is what I would be using. Um, yeah. But again, you know, you have to, you know, kind of weigh your options. With FX9, I have an internal variable ND and full size XLR with phantom power. Um, yeah. Am I going to bring this out to every commercial now? Probably not. Um, am I going to rig have this rigged out every time? Absolutely not. So again, it's just something that I wanted to basically. You know, it's a crash course in seeing how it handles. Yeah. It's also, um, you know, budget of the production. Like, what does production, what can production afford? And obviously, like, a whole FX9 package is more than an A7S3 package. Right. But uh, even yeah. if production pays for an A7S3, you still need it to work the way that you want it to work and the, do the things that you need it to do. So, options. 
just kind of use my gear tie and kind of cinch this cable down. And uh, that's actually something that we did actually a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago, I shot a commercial, and uh, production uh, didn't want to pay for an FX9 package. So the next best thing I, I could offer was a Pocket 6K. So that's what we used as our, our main camera. But it was rigged out something similar to this so that, um, again, when, on the day when we're actually filming in production, the last thing I want to be doing is fighting the camera. So that's basically, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you want to find the shortcomings of your camera system, whatever they may be. And then these accessories are the workarounds to those issues. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see what else we got here. Also, that C500 Mark II, that looks killer. And C300 Mark III, like those new body styles, those cube style rigs, like, Yeah, oh, I dig them. I dig them. I think Canon is definitely nailing it on the ergonomics, at least. I personally haven't shot on them, so I don't know what the actual usability of it is, but at least the ergonomics are there. Um, so this is basically, here, let me see if I can do this. Um, something like this is basically what we rocked. Uh, the only thing I'm missing is the most important part of the camera rig is the map box. This is, is what is going to make you look cool. Um, <laughs> if you don't have one of these, you're not a real filmmaker. Not uh, a real YouTuber. You're not. <laughs> um, so this is obviously for filtration since, you know, using the FX9, I would have in, internal variable NDs. Um, but if I'm using this guy, you need a map box. So map box there. So there you have it. This guy is heavy. <laughs> 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 and again, that's what we, you know, that's exactly what we want, especially, you know, that all that added weight is going to take away the micro jitters. And yes, this camera does have internal IBIS and sensors, steady shot, all that stuff. But, um, in commercial settings, that's that's kind of what I don't want to use. I, I would maybe, I'll of course, use those when I'm uh, filming B-roll. But in any other sense, I would turn steady shot, all that stuff off, and that's what we did for the commercial, just because it, it'll 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 try to stabilize things when I don't want it to be stabilized. So there's a time and place for steady shot and IBIS and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of commercial stuff, um, in a sense, all of this weight is your steady shot. Yeah. Um, Options. What else? Uh, I need a I need a battery, right? No, you know. Who needs a battery? Let's see. I think power, I got power with the sun. Uh, let's see. Kinefinity. Kinefinity Edge. Have I tried the Mavic? No, I have not tried any Kinefinity camera. Um, nope. <laughs> I've not tried any Man. Kinefinity camera. Um, I've heard a lot about them. Uh, I've never tried them. Can't really speak to that one. I hear cool things. And it's cool that they're doing what they're doing, but... You know, same. Personally, yeah. haven't used one. Never used one. Um, all right, so this is a good question here. Do I think remote production will continue to become popular? If, if so, what technologies need to improve for remote production? So the last two jobs I did were remote production. Uh, Jeremy and I were just we, we were just on a job yesterday. And producers were in New York. Um, it was for uh, GQ. It was a pretty cool gig. Um, but it was all remote. So basically, we had two FX9s, and we were piping them in through Zoom. And yeah, I think it'll be, it's a very popular thing right now. And even the job yeah. before that, it was just a direct yeah. piece of camera and piped through Zoom. So um, <laughs> what technologies would need to improve for remote productions? I would say if anything right now, if you want to get into remote productions, get a hotspot, like broadband hotspot. Get, get a your good own. Don't internet look connection. Yeah, don't rely on you know your location's Wi-Fi or anything like that. And that's why you know it's, uh, cell phone companies offer you know business-style hotspots where you, you can connect up to 10, 15 devices or whatever. Um, but that's also why Teradek makes their line of remote production type stuff like video over IP, um, where it has two different broadband connections or cellular connections and one acts as a backup. So to, does doesn't matter what gear you have. For remote production, if you don't have a connection, it's not going to work. Yeah, Joe, tell, tell them about uh, yesterday, what was happening. Uh, so with the uh, production, like the producers and directors Zooming, like connecting in through Zoom, um, 
it the zoom connection kept cutting out and the way that we had it set up we had a feed from our uh, a cam and b cam sent piped into zoom uh using um how did you do it like th using decimators or something uh, to what? pipe in the feed to zoom so that uh, they can a, see i was using a uh, aja utap that's right um and so that they could see what our angle looks like um but also having another connection so that uh, our the person getting interviewed can see the interviewer who's remoting in too. And so like you have multiple upstreams and downstreams going on at once. Our connection, like the Wi-Fi was really shoddy. So uh, the really angle, bad. yeah, really bad. And Zoom likes to just automatically dip you out of the room if the connection doesn't go through. So our signal kept dropping in and out. Thankfully, the actual interviewer didn't drop out. Uh, that angle didn't drop out. It was only the angle of the uh, playback that we we had to run. So, you know. Internet needs to improve. Back. Yep. <laughs> Internet needs to improve. Should have gotten uh, an iPhone 12 for that 5G. <laughs> See Adonis is also shout out to Absolutely Geeked. He just uploaded a chan um, a video, kind of comparing speeds with 5G on the iPhone 12. It's crazy fast. Yeah, when is Adonis gonna get back out here? We need to do a remote stream with that guy. <laughs> we need to go out there. <laughs> We're gonna be out there and well, that's he, I mean. Uh, Look at us right Just now. Just so you we're, know, he lives in uh, Australia, by the way. <laughs> yeah, look at us right now. We're, we're doing a remote stream. So uh, it's definitely going to take, you know, the repercussions of everything that's going on, they're going to be lasting for years. So mm -hmm. um, it's only going to get more and more uh, reliant on remote productions. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely important to kind of educate yourself on how to, how you can facilitate that for people that ask. So, you know, that means picking up capture cards, capture devices, whether it's, you know, Azure UTAPs, Blackmagic, uh, deck link. Yeah. yeah deck links, uh, mul uh, decimator, multi viewers, all that stuff to kind of, mm -hmm. uh, make yourself really, you know, appealing for producers that want to hire you out for remote, remote production. All right, let's see. Ken is saying that the C70 is horrible to use. Komodo is a dream by comparison. So that's interesting. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, me personally, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it depends on what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. I have my own thoughts about red. Um, uh, yeah. But, you know, again, the ergonomics of the C70 seem. I've, you know, I've never held one. I've never, you know, actually used one. So, take everything with a gear and the salt. But. Yeah. Uh, and again, like Canon has had a long history with developing their UI and, and stuff like that um, and their software. So they have that going. And with Komodo, like, yeah, the concept is really cool. And I, I've i seen a couple around. I personally still, again, grain of salt, I haven't personally used one. Um, but I, I mean, we both know people who have Komodos and we're in, you know, the Facebook groups and all that. And all I see are people complain about software issues and stuff and obviously the komodo i think is still in beta right now so you know we're complaining about a beta camera so it's hard hard to like it's apples and oranges there's no way to get an evf on the c70 interesting i did not know that yeah i, I mean that's if you use an EVF. I personally don't use one too often. Um, but if you do use an EVF, then yeah, that would be a big issue. Uh, to get around that, obviously, I mean, if you need an EVF and you need a documentary style camera, I would just look at the C300 series or the C500. All right, so we got a question from Andy. Uh, what made me gradually shift away and phase out Secudo's rigging products? Um, Ultimately, I mean, I didn't necessarily phase them out. I still use them. It just, I mean, it, again, it's going back to it all depends on the job. So if I'm doing a lot of shoulder stuff, they make a great VCT Pro that Jeremy and I both use. Mm -hmm. um, the VCT Pro is great. So, but honestly, I haven't been doing a lot of uh, shoulder work lately. Um, if I do, I, I'll swap. I'll basically swap out my FX9 stuff out for uh, some Zagudo stuff. I'll leave the top plate and stuff because obviously that stuff's great. 
Um, but I still use a, a lot of Zacuto stuff uh, every now and then. It, I mean, again, it all just depends. Yeah. I know this is overkill, but for FS7 and FX9, you want <laughs> a little more bougie. Ari also makes broadcast plate for it. I personally love using this yeah, thing. Yeah, Jeremy loves that bougie shit. Yeah. I mean, that's just me. Uh, you don't, Obviously, you do not need this. You can just go with the Zacuto VCT Pro, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I like it. No, it's a good it's a great I'm the play. one using it. It's, I'm the one using it, so. It's, it's solid. Um, another off-topic question. Did I see Borat 2? I did. I saw it last night. I loved Dude, it. Dude, me too. Did you see it? You watched it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Incredible. How? I'm, I'm probably going to watch it again tonight, to be honest. Man, wow. I do not want to be on that production. That was a that was a fun time. That was a fun time. Yeah, good, great, awesome. Ten out of ten. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that pretty much wraps up my rig. Um, and let me go kind of a full screen here. Look at that chunky boy. That is a chunky boy. Yeah, that's what my rig looked like when I had the A7S2, and I couldn't afford oh. an FS7. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, now this. And again, if if you if I shot, I'm gonna go back to all the footage that we shot on this guy uh, last weekend. If you told me that it was shot off of FX9, I would have probably believed you. Um, so it's kind of cool that these cameras can be intercut uh, so well. And the the footage coming out of the A7S III is ridiculous. Um, it grades so nicely. I'm such a huge fan of this camera and. You know, it again. I, you'll probably never, almost never, see it like this. If anything, you'll probably see my FX9 if I'm if I'm actually needing a robust camera for for commercial. But again, this is just to kind of see how well it handles in uh, in production environments. So nifty, clean, tidy. Nifty, nifty boy. So uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be sharing that uh, that gym BTS uh, probably in the next few weeks. Uh, I still got to edit it and all that stuff. I'm I'm actually super slammed with editing and stuff like that. So, yeah, we got a lot, got a lot to cover. But uh, yeah, Jeremy, you got anything else? Nope, I think I think that's it. Of course, you got your Teradek RT. Yep, yep. Ready to go. Um, Teradek's ready to go. Send out to a feed. Get your monitor. I can power this on. Actually, just so I can have an idea, I just put on a 98 water water 98 watt hour gold mount <laughs> battery. And I get around four hours, four hours of runtime with everything powered on. So I think for the uh, commercial that we were doing, what did we swap batteries like once? Yeah, just once. Yeah, there you go. And like towards the end, we, I mean, honestly, we could have just lasted the whole time. I just wanted to be safe. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you can add a shark fan if you wanted to get a little bit more extra weight. But, um, you know, five hours of runtime, four or five hours all you need so um thanks for everyone for tuning in for the stream uh unless you guys have any other questions that's that's about it from us um that was that was fun we're 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 walking yeah. up on a uh, almost three hour stream here oh my goodness that was pretty good we had a we had a lot of good uh kind of uh, viewers coming in i think a concurrent peak concurrent was like one in the 150s that was kind of cool Ooh, i like that yeah. thanks guys i don't even know 150 people that's pretty cool i don't even know two people I don't even know myself. Uh, Ken is asking uh, if I had the chance to try the R5. Detail is amazing. I've not tried, had the chance to try an R5. Um, I haven't actually used a Canon camera in a very long time, um, other than like a C300 Mark yeah. II. Those new C300 Mark III's and you know the C500 II's, those, those look really cool. But no, I haven't, I haven't tried a, uh, a Canon yeah. camera in a while. Also, Vegas seems to be a Sony market. Um, just that's just in my experience because anytime i i do gigs here it's always you know fs7 and stuff like that sony cameras canon usually shows up on like new york gigs or yeah yeah I, actually new york gigs yeah i can see that yeah. like bt or vitech Vi, or vicom i mean yeah <laughs> great success very nice, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> what else does he say Junkie, <laughs> Junkie. Uh, but yeah, no. Thanks everyone for for tuning in the stream. Um, I had a fun time. I think next week we'll probably uh, have uh, another guest on. 
we'll try to get my good buddy Sean on on, on kind of the ins and outs of, of being an owner operator, uh, especially in this day and age. And and we might even have Jeremy come in too if he's uh, willing to 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 grace us oh, with man. his with his presence because we all have kind of different I'm insights sleeping. and. <laughs> We all have kind of different insights and backgrounds on how we operate as kind of our own, you know, one-man armies and uh, kind of navigating that whole space. So we'll try to try to get that going. But uh, if anything, just you know, keep keep it locked to the channel. <laughs> Jeremy, where where can they find you? Um, I don't even know where to find myself. Uh, you can follow us. I mean, you can check out our website, ismahawk.com. All the links are on there. Ismahawk.com. Instagram. Uh, it's Mahawk. Or me personally, it's Jeremy Lee with three Y's. There you go, Jeremy Lee with three Y's. Uh, a couple of last minute yeah. questions. Uh, last one here from uh, Joe's Tavern. I haven't seen any tutorials uh, from Linda to covering color matching lights with XY like you have. Can I recommend any tutorials? Um, honestly, I don't really know of any tutorials. That's kind of why I made the video that I did. <laughs> um, the, you might might have some luck with uh, Siconic's channel, their YouTube channel. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know any tutorials offhand. It's just kind of grabbing a meter. I'm lucky that I have one, so I can just mess with it. And, you know, a lot of it's just, you know, metering and just testing it for yourself. So there's that. All right, y'all. Well, thanks again for the stream. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Thanks, y'all.